and Commission for Citizen Involvement meeting. I'd like to uh, now call the meeting to order. Iris, would you please call the roll? Beckett? Here. Fisher? Here. Heap? Here. Leak is excused. Pape? Here. Semler is excused. Stewart is excused. Councillor Maboot? Here. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Iris. Uh, we do have a quorum. Uh, so I'd like to uh, make a couple uh, early announcements uh, tonight, and then we'll go into uh, the rest of the agenda, and that'll be the council update first. But uh, on our agenda tonight, uh, we do have a public hearing uh, followed by a work session on House Bills 2001 and 2003. So based on the uh, input that uh, staff received today, for those who would like to uh, make uh, public uh, testimony, uh, I'd like to uh, recommend uh, that we defer uh, item number eight on our agenda, the work session uh, for House Bills 2001 and 2003. Uh, we'll uh, try to reschedule this uh, for uh, June 28th. Um, and then some uh, other announcements along the lines, just uh, based on uh, everyone that would like to uh, give uh, testimony uh, we'll probably adjourn tonight uh, by uh, 10 p.m. Uh, and so I'll, I'll give more details as we get into the specifics on the public uh, hearing, but just wanted to set that up front uh, and then we can give uh, additional uh, details on uh, the public hearing for LU 210019, the uh, Community Development Code and Comprehensive Plan Map and Zoning Map Amendments to the Boones Ferry Road staging area. Uh, so if, those, if, if there's anyone that has attended and there's attending or is here tonight uh, for item number eight on the agenda, again, uh, we'll be uh, rescheduling that uh, for uh, June 28th. Uh, you don't have to stay on for the whole thing, but you're welcome to. Uh, and with that, I'd like to then move back to the regular items on uh, our agenda. Uh, the first item on our agenda is a council update. Uh, Councilor Mbuk, would you like to give us a council update? Hi, thank you. Chair, uh, good morning, um, Commissioner. Uh, uh, the update will be more, I'm gonna start with the Planning Commission. I think uh, the last uh, meeting, we uh, moved to remove the sunset uh, that we had on the short-term rental and uh, it was seven to zero vote to the council remove the sunset date altogether and uh, allow short-term renters to operate in, in Lake Oswego. Uh, another important item also was we moved to, add, to allow the planning department for, to create an ad hoc, ad hoc middle housing code advisory committee. And I think uh, uh, Mr. Siegel started something. Uh, I missed that meeting. I'm sorry about it, but there's some good work that the city employees are doing. It's uh, regarding HB 2001 that was in the agenda today. And uh, for as a meeting, the Laura budget were adopted in that meeting. It's uh, for an amount of 37,247,060. $8. We also uh, adopted the budget like there was an arrangement for a uh, the, the uh, building department were asking us to give $500,000 more for because of many problems that they face during construction because of the pandemics and everything and we adopted that. Uh, uh, City Hall project will be all finished by the fall of, of this year. And the City Hall project that was for around $43 million in 2019 will, when everything is done, will be 36,965,146. So we also adopted the biennium 
budget and it's uh, in the amount of 406 million seven hundred thirty five thousand six hundred fifty three there's a lot of numbers today but i just wanted the uh, uh, planning to be informed about that and we adopted also this month as pride month and uh, going forward lake oswego will celebrate the pride month as part of our uh, agenda of our calendar uh, uh, of the city so i think that's uh, what i have thank you thank you councillor mbu yeah. uh, commissioners any questions the councillor mbu i don't see any all right thanks again councillor mbu uh so next on our agenda are the minutes from may 24th 2021 uh, commissioners, any uh, comments or changes uh, that commissioners would like to request uh, to the minutes? I, see I move to accept the minutes as is. There's a motion to accept the minutes as is. There's a second. I'll second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Any abstains? None. All right, the minutes are adopted. Thank you. And then uh, next on our agenda uh, is uh, the, uh, oh, excuse me, I skipped over the Commission for Citizen Involvement and uh, public comment. Let me just come back to that quickly. Uh, Iris, uh, was there anyone who wished to make a public comment regarding issues not on the agenda tonight? No. All right, thank you. And then the Commission for Citizen Involvement general updates. Uh, I didn't have any updates that I wanted to give tonight for the Commission for Citizen Involvement. So uh, we will move to item seven on the agenda, which is the uh, Community Development Code and Comprehensive Plan Map and Zoning Map Amendments to the Boones Ferry Staging Area, LU 21-0019. Um, public testimony is accepted. Uh, a limit of five minutes per individual applies. Uh, anyone who uh, wish to provide testimony tonight should have uh, emailed uh, Iris at the address listed in the uh, agenda uh, by noon uh, today uh, to receive the uh, logon information. Uh, so a um, couple more comments uh, before we get started, then I'll let uh, Attorney Boone and staff uh, maybe make some opening comments too. The uh, adjourn adjournment tonight, time uh, tonight we're trying to set to uh, around uh, 10 p.m. Uh, so we'll probably uh, stop uh, you know, uh, with the last testimony uh, around uh, 9.55. Uh, but uh, everyone uh, should have uh, signed up. Uh, and if anybody, uh, for anyone who has signed up, uh, if we don't hear you tonight, uh, we'll make sure that, um, you know, we carry over uh, to uh, the next uh, meeting uh, and we'll give an opportunity for to, to hear you there. So uh, all voices will be heard. But the most important thing is, is that, you know, you need to be uh, signed up. Uh, Iris needs to have uh, your name on the list. Um, uh, the, so the, to be more specific, the uh, hearing uh, will be, uh, you know, uh, open. Uh, we may continue it if we don't, if we can't conclude tonight by 9.55, uh, but uh, it will be uh, left open and then closed uh, once we have all the testimony uh, complete. Uh, so. I think those have covered all the points. Uh, maybe, maybe a little bit um, uh, of suggestions on how we can be efficient. So uh, if um, somebody has uh, submitted a letter, we'd ask that rather than reading the letter, if they can just reference it and add any other comments, but um, you know, avoid just uh, reading a letter. I know we received uh, some this afternoon and the commission has read through that. Um, and then, um, you know, if a speaker before you uh, has, you know, made points uh, that you would like to make, uh, you know, rather than uh, restating them, you know, just you can simply state that you support their testimony. And then of course, add anything uh, new uh, that you have to say. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we, we do have a large number of people that would like to give testimony. So trying to kind of adopt these uh, guidelines uh, to make it very efficient and then make sure that in a reasonable amount of time, we can really hear everybody that wishes to speak tonight. That's kind of the goal behind it to make sure that everybody's voices are heard. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, 
ask a staff if they'd like to give an update or if they'd like to uh, read, if the uh, attorney uh, Boone would like to read any uh, opening statements. Uh, I would, Mr. Chair, uh, sure. Evan Boone here, Deputy City Attorney. And I would uh, highlight to the commission that this is a quasi-judicial procedure. Uh, unlike most of your hearings, which are held in a legislative manner, the quasi-judicial proceeding means that uh, the parties speak to you on a, a, with a certain time limit. They are to address the criteria, and you will be considering the application based upon that criteria. Uh, from that, then the recommendation then goes to the city council. At that point, the record that is developed here at the planning commission is the record before the city council. No new, no new evidence will be presented to the city council. So any persons who wish to present evidence regarding this matter should do so before the planning commission. Parties uh, before the city council may present argument based upon issues that are raised at this hearing, but no new evidence may be presented. Uh, so with that, I would now go through the hearing procedure uh, and, uh, and disclaimers as it were. Uh, this land use request involves the application of the criteria and standards which are listed in the staff report, which are available online. Uh, testimony and evidence must be directed towards that applicable criteria listed in the staff report or such as other criteria contained within LCDC goals, ORS Chapter 197, and other applicable state statutes and administrative rules, and the land use comprehensive plan and land use regulations that you believe apply to this decision. Please specifically identify the criteria or standards you're addressing so the commission may consider your testimony in relation to the criteria or standards that you are asking the commission to consider. If you do not identify the criteria or standards you're addressing, the commission is not obliged to guess which standards or criteria you're testifying about and may not consider your testimony in its decision. Additionally, failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the commission and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue precludes raising the issue to the city council and on appeal to the Oregon Land Use Board of Appeals based on that issue. The failure of the applicant to raise uh, any constitutional or other issues relating to any proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow the commission to respond to the issue precludes an action for damage to the circuit court. The public hearing process is as follows. It'll be a presentation by staff then testimony by the uh, applicant or by staff uh, then testimony by the applicant up to 20 minutes. In this case, it's the same. I think they could probably get it uh, within the 20 minutes. Um, then we have testimony by parties in, po uh, in support of the application. We group all those testimony by persons in support of the application together. Then we have testimony by parties opposed to the application. And then finally, testimony by those neither for nor against the application. Individuals will be allowed up to five minutes. Any person in attendance may cede his or her time for testimony to another person, uh, except to the applicant, but in no case shall any person's testimony be increased to greater than 10 minutes. Recognized neighborhood associations, homeowner associations, government or government agencies, or other incorporated public interest organizations will be allowed up to, up to 10 minutes. Following that would be the applicant's rebuttal, up to five minutes, and then commission deliberation. Uh, including a statement uh, if, if there are any con proposed conditions of approval different than contain the staff report, uh, the applicant have an opportunity to respond to the, those conditions of approval proposed following commission deliberation. Now, these time limits do not include time spent responding to any questions from the commission. Testimony by attorneys, representatives, and witnesses on behalf of or which are part of the presentation by a person shall be counted within that person's time limit. Is assumed that persons are testifying their own behalf unless they expressly identify the recognized neighborhood association, homeowner association, government or government agency, or, or other incorporated public interest organi organization they are representing. At this point, I would ask the commission members to please declare if you have any ex parte contacts, including a site visit, if you have any bias on the application, and any financial conflicts of interest to declare. Uh, Chair Heap, if you will start with that declaration and then poll the rest of the commissioners again for ex parte contacts, bias, or financial conflicts of interest. Yeah, I've had uh, no ex parte contacts. I've had no site visits. Uh, I have uh, no uh, financial uh, conflict of interest. And um, the third uh, criteria? Attorney bias. Bias. I have no bias. Uh, so now I'd like to uh, poll the other commissioners. I'll start with Commissioner Beckett. Aye. 
I'm in the same category as Commissioner Heap. None of those biases or problems. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Becker, just to be clear, no ex parte contacts, site visits, no uh, bias, and uh, no financial conflict of interest, correct? Yes. Correct. Right. Uh, Commissioner Fisher? Just saying, I, I am like Commissioner uh, Heap and yeah. Commissioner Becker. Oh, that's fine. All right. Uh, Vice Chair Pape? Yeah, no ex parte, uh, no bias, uh, no site visits other than driving by and looking at it, but that's about it. And no financial conflict of interest. And no financial, yeah, sorry. Thank you. All right, I think we've uh, got all the commissioners. All right, is there any challenge to a commissioner's right to consider the application from any member of the audience? Hearing none, I believe Director uh, Scott Siegel, Director of Planning and Building Services, has a staff report. Thank you, Mr. Boone. Good evening, Chair Heap, members of the Planning Commission. Good evening. Uh, the staff presentation will be brief this evening as the, the application is proposed by the city. And we have some folks here who are assisting city staff in presenting the application. Uh, just first, first off, a, a word about staff's role. And I'll, I'll get to introducing the staff who are in the, in the room in the meeting. Uh, you know, we're directed by city council to initiate a rezoning application and to bring this application forward for your consideration. Um, you know, as part of a longstanding city council goal to explore the possibility of affordable housing um, in this location and uh, part of a broader initiative that we've, we've been uh, partnering with agencies, including Clackamas County and Metro to try to expand housing opportunities in the city in order to meet an identified housing need a longstanding need that's not unique to Lake Oswego and is, is um, severe. Uh, so that's why we're uh, in initiating the application. Um, our role, of course, as always, is to support uh, the planning commission and council to provide expertise and to provide technical uh, support and factual information to support your decisions. We're not here um, to make a decision. That's, that's your role is to make a recommendation to city council. Uh, we do, however, have a responsibility to make sure that you have accurate and timely information. So if, uh, through this process, if there's anything at all uh, based on your understanding of the criteria that uh, you feel is lacking or you would like additional information from the city, uh, we're here to support you on that. I just want you to know that. And I wanted it, the public to understand what our role is here, and that is to support uh, the community in this endeavor. Um, so with that, I'll introduce our staff. We have Erica Rooney is our city engineer and public works director. She's here uh, to help uh, answer any questions you might have. Uh, Will Farley is our traffic engineer on staff. And uh, the consulting team is led by Frank Angelo with Angelo Planning Group. He'll be presenting the application or the proposal. Um, and Ralph Terran uh, with Terran Architecture and Planning. And Mr. Terran prepared the site uh, development study that was uh, the basis for our, our evaluation of the proposed code changes so that we had some assurance that what we were uh, bringing before you would in fact uh, achieve the outcome that is um, requested or that's proposed and that the um, city's housing needs analysis justifies. So that's our, our team. Um, the uh, proposal is uh, Mr. Angelo will go into a little bit more details to allow multifamily affordable housing um, in the subject area to meet an identified housing need and consistent with city council goals. Uh, no development, and I'll repeat that, no development is proposed with this application. Um, there's no development proposed at this time. At such a time that there is a development request that comes before the city, um, it would follow the same process that any other development um, of this type would follow. Um, it would, there would be a pre-application conference required by the city. Uh, the recognized neighborhood associations would be invited to that pre-application conference. Um, there would be neighborhood contact in the way of a required neighborhood meeting that would occur um, before a development application could be filed with the city. Um, and then the app an application uh, once submitted would be subject to the same code that any other development of this type uh, would be subject to. And it would go before the Development Review Commission in a public hearing. So it actually come before a different hearing body. Um, the property is not under contract. Um, it's, there's no option to sell the property. Uh, the city is not 
in negotiations. I can just say that to be completely transparent, we're not in negotiations with any party to sell the property at this time. Uh, that's a separate city council action, actually, and it's not before the planning commission. Um, it would require a different process, in fact, for the city to surplus the land to sell it. Um, and that process would follow the zoning amendments. The cities follow the required public noticing and uh, review procedures up to this point uh, to bring this application before you. Um, and we believe, you know, based on the application and the staff report that the application addresses the criteria for quasi-judicial amendments to the comprehensive plan map, the zoning map, and the community development code. Um, you have received uh, public testimony, written testimony. Um, the testimony in support is labeled exhibits G100 through 105. Um, the testimony in opposition uh, up to this point or up to probably three or four o'clock this afternoon uh, was labeled G200 through G232. And uh, we had received one uh, testimonial uh, neither for nor against, and that's labeled exhibit G001. Um, we may have, I, I believe, and Iris uh, Michaela can confirm this, if we have received any other testimony um, in writing prior to your hearing, uh, the commission will receive that. And, uh, we will process it. Uh, those exhibits will receive exhibit labels and they will be uh, compiled for the, for the planning commission for your consideration uh, before you deliberate on this case. So I just wanted to make sure you're aware of that. Uh, finally, we would request that the Planning Commission take notice of two items um, that are, um, one is Ordinance 2640, Section 3, and that's the city's housing needs analysis. Uh, and it's referenced in the application. Um, and we wanted to ask the Planning Commission to take notice of that because although it's um, not required to be entered into the record in order for you to consider that information, uh, we wanted you to, to take note of it so that um, the public was aware that you were in fact considering the city's housing needs analysis when you're evaluating this application. Um, and the second item is City Council Resolution 21-05, and that's the memorandum of understanding between um, the City of Lake Oswego, the Housing Authority of Clackamas County, and Metro that the city entered into um, earlier this year um, and which one demonstrates a, a housing need and two uh, initiates or supports the city initiating this zoning request that it is in fact in the public interest that we're doing this. So um, with that, I'll conclude the staff presentation and um, cede the rest of my time, or I guess I don't have to cede my time. I'm handing it over to the applicant to um, uh, present the city's uh, proposal, Mr. Angelo, if you would please, and his yes. team. Thank you, Scott. Um, for the record, I'm Frank Angelo, Angelo Planning Group. Um, and I would, in addition to Ralph Terran with our, our planning team, we also have Matt Hugart with Kittleson and Associates who's with us tonight and who will talk to some of the transportation issues that have been raised uh, in the testimony. And then Courtney Sims from my staff is here as well. Courtney will be uh, running the, the PowerPoint presentation. So Courtney, if you wouldn't mind starting. We have about a 10 to 15 minute presentation and uh, then obviously we will be available for questions. As Scott said, this is the, we're calling this the Boone's Ferry Road, West Sunset Drive zoning map amendments. It's, for, it's actually a, a quasi-judicial uh, amendment uh, to the, the comprehensive plan map and zoning map, as well as to the community development code. Um, I would like to just add to a couple comments that uh, uh, Scott had in terms of the notice uh, in the area, we did conduct uh, two meetings with the community in the area. Uh, on May 4th, we conducted a neighborhood uh, association meeting um, uh, via, via Zoom and uh, invited the Lake Forest Neighborhood Association, as well as the Lake Grove Neighborhood Association and the Waluga Neighborhood Association and the Lake Grove Business Association. Uh, we're in all in attendance at that uh, neighborhood meeting. Uh, the following day, we on May 5th, we conducted a community meeting with housing advocates 
uh, in the area. So we have gone to the community at least on two occasions um, uh, with the proposal. Next slide, please, Courtney. This is the area we are referring to. Uh, the area in red is the Boone's Ferry West Sunset Drive sub area. And when I use the term sub area from now on out, I'll be referring to this uh, area. It's, it is a 1.3 acre, 38 acre site. Uh, it is within the Lake Forest Neighborhood Association as, and as well it is within the Westlake Grove Design District. Um, next slide, please. The site itself is bounded by Boone's Ferry Road on the south and West Sunset Drive on the north and east. Um, the, this, this slide shows the location of the sub area within the context of the West Lake Grove Design District. The design district itself provides specific standards for future development within its boundaries. And the standards include address street, street pathway connectivity, orientation of building, design issues, setbacks and buffering, open space, landscape and tree preservation. Next slide, please. The current zoning in the sub area is, uh, there are six tax lots and this, this map shows the current zoning within the sub areas. You can see there are three different zones on the site itself. Um, the bulk of the area is in the West Lake Grove office commercial zone. On the northern side of the sub area, it is in the West Lake Grove R, R2.5 zone. And the triangle down in the southwest corner is in the West Lake Grove uh, um, residential mixed use zone. The Westlake Grove R2, uh, R2.5 zone allows, res allows residential and multifamily only up to townhomes. It does not allow multifamily or apartments. The res Westlake Grove residential mixed use allows does allow multifamily, but that multifamily has to be pr uh, provided in conjunction with uh, commercial. Within the uh, Westlake Grove Design District, the office commercial, Westlake Grove office commercial zone does not allow residential uses. I would note for the record that uh, office commercial in other areas of the city do, does uh, uh, allow uh, residential uses, but in this particular area, uh, residential uses are not allowed in the Westlake Grove office commercial zone. Next slide, please. So in order to um, provide residential uh, and multifamily uh, development uh, on the site, there are cer certain proposed actions that need to occur. One is code amendments to allow residential uses within the West Lake Grove office commercial zone within the sub area. The second item would be to zone change and comprehensive plan map amendments on the two other uh, zone uh, districts uh, uh, to unify the site within the Westlake Grove office commercial uh, zone. And all these proposed actions that we're talking about tonight would apply only within the area that we've identified as the sub area, that 1.3 acre, uh, 38 acre site uh, that's outlined in red. There's one additional um, uh, amendment that is being requested and that deals with the uh, design standards relating to height. Uh, we will talk about that in a moment, but um, in effect, what we are, what the uh, application does request is that the 35 foot height limit uh, within the Westlake Grove office commercial zone be increased by five feet uh, to 40 feet. Next slide, please. Once the proposed zoning is applied to the area, um, this map shows the what the configuration would be. The six tax lots would be unified under the Westlake Grove office commercial zone. And with the code amendments, residential uh, uses would be allowed within uh, the office commercial zone. Next slide, please. So in terms of background, a uh, little history, um, the Lake Oswego Redevelopment Agency purchased the property back in 
2018 for construction eight staging for the ongoing Boone's Ferry Road project. That project will wind up by phase one, at least by the end of 2021. And at that time, the city will be looking at a different use on the property. On March 16th, 2021, the city council adopted uh, resolution 2105 that authorized an agreement with Metro and the Housing Authority of Clackamas County to explore options to add housing to the staging area site. And the action tonight would allow for future housing development on the 1.38 acres uh, construction staging area. Next slide. In terms of housing needs, Scott referred to the housing needs analysis that the city prepared in, in 2013. That housing needs analysis indicated a need for housing for affordable, uh, that for affordable housing for lower income households uh, with young families and with children. And the, the goal is to provide housing diversity for these individuals and families within the community. According to staff, there has been no new low income housing created in the city for over 10 years. And when we refer to affordable housing um, and in terms of low income resident households, it's being defined as households earning 80% or less of the area median income or AMI in Clackamas County. And according to the Housing Authority of Clackamas County, 80% AMI calculates to about $74,000 for a family of four, which translates to the starting pay for a Lake Oswego firefighter. Next slide, please. The city in the past has supported the provision of affordable housing within the community. Uh, since 2016, the council has taken some steps to prioritize the creation of multifamily affordable housing by amending sections in this development code to streamline permitting for housing, as well as adopting financial incentives such as system development charge and fee waivers for eligible multifamily projects. In 2019, the city council established a goal of realizing a Metro housing bond funded project within Lake Oswego. And this past year, the council established the following directive to begin to work to construct at least one new affordable housing project by rezoning the Boone's Ferry Road staging area to allow for an affordable housing development. This uh, application that's before the Planning Commission tonight is the culmination of that directive. We're bringing forth the uh, findings and the uh, application to uh, allow uh, the rezoning of the Boone's Ferry Road air staging area for affordable housing development. Next slide, please. Again, the proposed amendments that in order to permit residential uses on the site the following actions must occur. First, the code amendments to allow residential uses in the Westlake Grove office commercial zone. Again, they are not currently allowed within the Westlake Grove design district in office commercial. And then the zone change and comprehensive plan map amendment to unify the site within a single zone, the Westlake Grove office commercial zone. Next slide, please. The proposed zoning amendments are, there are four specific targeted amendments uh, in the, to the zoning ordinance. The first is to an amendment to the use table and it would be to permit multifamily residential uses within the Westlake Grove office commercial zone limited to the Boone's Ferry Road West Sunset Drive sub area. So this, these actions would occur only within that sub area that uh, has been identified by the um, uh, uh, red boundary. The second zoning ordinance and map amendment would be to add the sub area, the, the red area as a specific location where multifamily residential use is allowed. The third area would be, as I mentioned earlier, the dimensional table, and that would allow five additional feet of height for multifamily development from 35 feet which is the current standard 240 feet in the Westlake Grove office commercial zone, only when that building is located at least 80 feet from single family R7.5 zone 
properties. So an additional buffer has been added to uh, compensate for that additional five feet. And then the fourth zoning ordinance amendment uh, would be to change the purpose statement in the design standards section of the code to add limited residential uses as uses allowed in the office commercial uh, zone in Westlake, in the Westlake Grove sub area. Next slide, please. So for the zone map and the comprehensive plan, <laughs> comprehensive plan map amendments, there are, as I mentioned, three existing zones within the sub area. Uh, the predominant zone, existing zone is Westlake Grove Office Commercial. So 1.13 acres of the 1.38 acres uh, in the sub area uh, is currently zoned Office Commercial and no change in zoning would be required. The Westlake Grove R2.5 or it totals 0.15 acres, and that would change to Westlake Grove Office Commercial. And then the Westlake Grove residential mixed use of 0.1 acres would change to Westlake Grove Office Commercial. So 0.25 acres it would be changed from a, an existing zone to the Westlake Grove Office Commercial Zone to unify the entire 1.3 acres as Office Commercial. Next slide, please. This shows again, the uh, existing zoning map. You can see where the R2.5 and the uh, RM, um, the mixed use at the bottom is located. Um, the current configuration actually does not correspond to tax lots, existing tax lots on the, on the site. And, and it has, that's somewhat problematic, problematic in and of itself. So, Unifying the site in a, into the single zone um, does add some um, clarity to the sub area. Next slide, please. And then this would be the proposed zoning map uh, once the, the, the comprehensive plan map and zoning map amendment uh, would be in place. Again, the sub area of 1.38 acres is the, the area in red. Next slide, please. As Scott mentioned in his introduction, there are certain criteria within the comprehensive plan uh, to that uh, comprehensive plan amendments and zone changes must address and those and demonstrate uh, compliance with. Uh, the proposed amendments in our application uh, are in conformance, we believe, with the applicable comprehensive plan regulatory policies, the Lake Forest Neighborhood Plan policies as well as statewide planning goals. Uh, the plan, the, the quasi-judicial plan, plan uh, ap application provides findings uh, uh, that demonstrate compliance with the applicable policies uh, in each of those documents. And there are some relevant factors. The traffic impact analysis um, um, is, needs to demonstrate compliance with the statewide planning goal 12. The state has a transportation planning rule that requires that zone changes and comp plan amendments uh, not have a significant effect on the transportation system. And Matt Hugart will touch on that uh, in, in a moment. And then the housing needs analysis, uh, as Scott mentioned, has historically demonstrated a need for more mixed use housing for types, types for households of different income levels within the city. Next slide, please. So some of the comprehensive plan policies include complete neighborhoods and housing. Uh, the Lake Forest Neighborhood Plan does have include a policy that allows for a change to higher density along arterial streets. And as I noted, the site does abut Boone's Ferry Road, which is an arterial and, was in, and is within a quarter mile of a transit uh, TriMet stop. The site is appropriate because of its proximity to available public facilities, access, and uh, proximity to employment. Another complete neighborhood and housing policy is to maintain an adequate supply of a variety of housing types. And the housing needs analysis in, uh, prepared in 2013 identified the need for over 2,300 new high density residential units uh, to meet the projected population forecast by 2020, 2035. Uh, and as far back as 2005, an affordable housing task force identified the need for more affordable housing in Lake Oswego. 
Next slide, please. Economic vitality is another comprehensive plan policy. The neighborhood village center designations uh, that are subject, that the property is subject to uh, will continue. The amendments will ensure that any future development is at a scale and character with the surrounding residential area. And the surrounding residential area consists of a mix of high density housing, uh, office and low density residential uh, single family development. As importantly, the West Lake, West, uh, Lake Grove design standards uh, that are adopted will continue to apply. And this will ensure that the neighborhood village character is, is met. The one exception to that is the, the height uh, modification that I mentioned from 35 to 40 feet. But other than that, the Westlake Grove design standards that are in place today will continue to apply and be applied to any future development on the site. Next slide, please. Connected community is an important uh, policy of the plan and transportation efficiency uh, it reflects that. The policy is to maintain level of service of arterial intersections. The transportation planning and anal rule analysis uh, has identified that multifamily housing as a permitted use in the office commercial zone will not increase potential traffic on the streets as compared to other uses in the, in the office commercial zone. Um, the 20 minute neighborhoods, multifamily, neighbor, multifamily housing will allow more efficient use and redevelopment within the neighborhood village. And Two by minutes. place, okay, uh, next slide, please. And we, the uh, connected community, uh, the uh, intent is to mitigate the impacts of traffic on neighborhood collectors, which I'm going to now turn it over. Next slide, please, to Matt Hugart to touch on uh, traffic impacts. So, next slide, please. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, Matt Hugart with Kittleson. Um, just real quickly, I, I think when it comes to assessing the transportation impacts on this project, it's really done at one very simplistic level, and that is addressing Oregon's transportation planning rule. Um, and essentially what we're doing is we're testing for significant effects. So the simplest way that, to do that is to just make a comparison between the trip making potential under the existing zoning versus the trip making potential under the proposed modified zone. And in doing so, I think we can, we found and concluded that uh, without getting into the specifics that under the proposed uh, zone modification, the trip making, the overall trip making potential of the site actually decreases uh, from what it would be uh, under the existing uh, zoning. So uh, therefore at a very, very high level, uh, we found that uh, the zone change will actually result in a decrease in trip making potential and therefore again at a very high level uh, would not impact uh, the transportation system or cause a significant effect. Uh, so in light of, of our time constraints, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and take questions later. Frankie, you're still on mute, I think. Next slide after this, please. Uh, just in, in summary, the as, as Scott noted, Ralph uh, Taren prepared a development study. And while this is not a development proposal, this was intended to demonstrate that um, the uh, existing design standards in the West Lake Grove Design District could be met, as well as to determine what the um, uh, potential was for uh, multifamily units on the site. Um, the development study Ralph prepared included three buildings, three stories each, 40 foot height limit, 50 to 54 units, and 68 parking spaces. Uh, and, and then one, one more slide, please. And then the included applying the Westlake Grove design standards to put a potential multifamily project to show what the uh, design might look like uh, if and when it was built on the property. So in, with that, I will wrap up and say that we appreciate the time tonight. Um, uh, we believe that our application has demonstrated compliance with the city's uh, comprehensive plan policies and objectives. The staff report uh, validates that and agrees with that. And we'd request the Planning Commission make a recommendation for approval. And we're here for questions. Thank you. Well, thank you for the uh, presentation.
uh, Attorney Boone, at this time, uh, we may take questions from the commissioners, correct? And is there Certainly. any time limits? Yeah. Uh, okay. No, no, no right. time limit in responding to commission questions. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, uh, questions uh, for uh, staff and the presenters. Vice Chair Pape. Sure, thank you. Uh, great presentation, thank you. Um, help me understand the necessity for these changes in the realm that we're all facing um, and, and going through, which we actually tabled to our next uh, or our later meeting regarding House Bills 2001 and 2003 uh, for multifamily housing. Can that not already go in place on this site? Here, I'd be happy to respond to Commissioner Pape's question. Uh, that's a very good question. And House Bill 2001 um, addresses multifamily housing in areas that are currently zoned for single family housing. And this is not one of those areas. This, this area um, doesn't allow any housing. Well, with the exception of the two small areas that are being remapped. Um, on another level, House Bill 2001 really focuses on smaller forms of multifamily housing, specifically duplexes, triplexes, uh, quadplexes, and townhomes, um, among others. And uh, you know those type, those uh, forms of housing meet a, meet a particular need. Townhomes are perhaps better than some of the other housing types at meeting a need for owner-occupied housing because the units are typically on you know, fee simple for sale lots. Um, the smaller multiplex units, the duplexes, uh, sometimes can uh, be condominiumized. They can be divided in that way and provide another owner um, home ownership opportunity. Uh, you know, the triplexes and quadplexes, although we don't really see many of those built, these days, I think, um, you know, those will probably tend to be more, um, you know, those will probably be more oriented towards rental housing, but uh, they're smaller forms of housing. And so the, the, the uh, funding that's available for affordable housing currently, and most of that funding is really coming through the Met Metro's regional housing bond, uh, that funding is going toward uh, larger multifamily uh, communities. And, and that has, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, it, it has to do with other funding sources that are available in the way of low-income housing tax credits and other capital that um, builders of nonprofit housing can pull together to actually create affordable housing communities. So it's really, um, I think that the House Bill 2001 implementation will address certain housing needs, but it doesn't really address the need that's intended to be met through this rezoning application. So if I, if I hear you correct, the rezoning of this parcel, to bring it all under the same zoning, would put it outside the bounds of House Bill 2001. Is that correct? Yeah, House Bill 2001 doesn't okay. ap apply to this site as it's currently zoned or, or as it's proposed to be changed. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Sorry, if um, those who aren't uh, speaking could go on mute. Uh, we we're getting a little bit of background noise there. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, other questions? Uh, I had uh, one question for uh, Mr. Angelo. Uh, when you were showing the requested uh, code amendment changes uh, to the office commercial uh, zone, uh, can you uh, re-show that uh, slide? Uh, I, I, I think I just had a question about understanding if uh, all of them, all the amendments requested only applied uh, to uh, the area that we're proposing to rezone tonight, or if it, if it would, if any of those amendments would go, uh, you know, outside of the uh, area that's uh, being proposed uh, for rezoning tonight. This is the slide you're referring to. Yes, yes. These would all apply only within the boundary with uh, that was this is identified as a sub area. Yes. Okay. And not not outside the the red boundary. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Pepe, I think you have another question. Yeah, I got a couple. Thank you. Um, 
in the testimony that or or in what in the staff report there was testimony in there from at least one if not more uh, individuals that property either immediately abuts and or surrounds the property that we're discussing now and or is in close proximity to that uh, requesting to be included in this zone change yet it seems like that property is not uh, up for discussion or um, uh, up for discussion. Can you help us understand why it's just this uh, parcel and why other properties would not be allowed to be rezoned as well? Yeah, uh, Commissioner Pape, Scott Siegel. Uh, that's a good question. And we, you know, we did consider whether uh, the city should, should apply for, uh, you know, these types of amendments on a larger area and perhaps uh, make it a legislative application, which I think, you know, the planning commission is accustomed to seeing legislative proposals. You, you also review quasi-judicial applications. Um, and when we looked at that, and we did this as part of uh, looking at alternatives, you know, looking at alternative sites that could be rezoned or alternative sites that are already zoned for multifamily that, that would be conducive to affordable housing. And the conclusion that we came to was that the other properties in the Westlake Grove office commercial zone um, are those that are, um, I, I can actually share a, a map of, of the comprehensive plan and that might be, make it easier to answer your question. So if you can see this, um, our site is shown in orange. The other um, properties that are zoned office commercial are shown you know, in this blue boundary that is um, surrounding the R2.5 and, and um, RMU. And the properties that you can see, the other properties that are designated OC, WGOC are across the street from this one on the south side of Boone's Ferry Road. Um, and uh, those properties have um, some limitations. Uh, I don't wanna really have the, I don't wanna ask the, the planning commission to really pass uh, judgment on, on you know, whether other properties could be rezoned, but we did look at these other properties and um, they, they tend to have more, uh, 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 more, a budding area. They, they abut uh, low density residential zones in more um, along more of the boundary than, than this area. So that was one reason we thought that uh, trying to you know rezone those properties would be more intrusive into uh, you know, low density residential neighborhood. Um, and the other is just having to do with transportation access and circulation and, and some of the challenges that are um, existing on the other side of Boone's Ferry Road. There is a planned um, intersection improvement. It is part of the city's capital improvement pr program, although it's unfunded, that would uh, show an extension of Sunset Drive south of Boone's Ferry Road, creating a four-way intersection there. Um, and there is the, the Westlake Grove uh, Design District plan actually has that future circulation um, identified in the code. Um, we just saw that it was a more constrained area for housing. So it's not to say that it couldn't be redesignated in the future. It just uh, was not included in this application for that reason, along with uh, others, one of which is that the city is the owner and the applicant of, of this area. We do not own or control other properties in the city um, that could be rezoned. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah. All right, commissioners, any other questions? I don't, uh, Vice Chair Pepe. I might just keep raising my hand, Chair Heap, or I can just keep going and, and you cut me off if somebody else has a question. I would say go with your list of questions just in the order of um, and, and, and being efficient. Uh, and sure. Uh, we'll come back to other commissioners. So I, the last two really that I've, I think they're probably of paramount to me are, um, I know that there's been no applications that have been uh, proposed or, or submitted. Uh, there's no talks um, with the city and, and any other parties to sell the property. But 
I do have a question on how many inquiries have there been on this piece of property that the city has received, um, as well as knowing that there haven't been any plans put forth, the plans that were just provided in the uh, PowerPoint presentation indicated that uh, it was based on low density housing, which that requirement or that threshold is, I might have the off on this, but either 80% or 75% of the uh, current income level for a family of four, yet only a third or less than a third of those units proposed in your PowerPoint presentation are for or would accommodate a family of four. I just find that a bit of a, uh, a bit ironic that that would be um, presented in that manner. So kind of like two questions there, if, if those could be, I don't know if that's Director Siegel or, or Mr. Angelo would be the, the better one to, to address those. So let me try to repeat the questions back, make sure I'm understanding. Um, so Commissioner Pape, first question you were asking is what other um, interest or ex uh, expressions of interest the city's received on the property? Is that in terms of yeah. land, land use applications or what? In inquiries on wanting to either purchase the property. Well, yeah, they would need to purchase the property in order to develop whatever it is that they would like to develop there. How many inquiries has the city received in, in this piece of property that, that we're discussing tonight? Well, I wouldn't have that information. I'm not even sure that it would be applicable or, or uh, relevant to the criteria. So, um, but I would defer to city attorney Boone and on some guidance or direction there on the question about um, uh, why, why did the uh, development study that was prepared for the rezoning application consider um, the, the mix of housing that it did? Why didn't it look at a mix of housing that had more larger units perhaps for families? Is that um, the premise? That's okay, that's, yeah. Um, well, the reason is this, and, and, and it has to do with looking at, you know, what I affectionately call a worst case scenario. <laughs> and that sounds worse than it really is. And what it, what it means is that for looking at zone changes, uh, we have to look, uh, and, and it goes to the, the transportation planning rule that, um, that uh, Mr. Hugar was discussing earlier. We have to look at what the uh, trip production or tr traffic generation would be under the proposal versus what currently is in the code. And so we wanted to look at a reasonable all, you know, scenario that would include both some you know, relatively small units, including studio units, some single bedroom units, two bedroom, three bedroom on up so that um, we would have a, re a plausible you know, scenario in terms of looking at a, a worst case traffic generation. If we had looked at only you know, three bedroom units, for example, we would have had fewer units resulting in less traffic potential. That's why we looked at a, a, a higher trip generating scenario. Thank you. Commissioners, any other questions? Oh, sorry, Attorney Boone, did you have a comment? Well, I, did Commissioner Pepe want me to respond on the saleability question? I, I specific, I mean, I, we have not identified that as a criteria standard either in this application or in any other zone change, uh, both public or private that we've had. Uh, so I, I don't see the relevance to the marketability or the plans of the owner for marketing. Um, in, in the code. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, any other uh, final questions or shall we open it up for public testimony? Uh, I don't see any other questions. Uh, so Attorney Boone, we'd like to uh, move uh, to open uh, public testimony. Again, is there any comments that we should uh, read before? Uh, no, they, they sat through the long one. So it's five minutes for individuals, 10 minutes for recognized neighborhood associations uh, and, and groups and that, and I'll time it. And just to be clear, a person cannot cede, you know, like the last two minutes of their time to somebody else who cede five minutes or nothing, you know, 10 minutes or nothing. So we will take the persons in support first, followed by opposition, then neither for nor against. Uh, thank you, Attorney Boone. I was going to also I'll summarize that. So uh, first uh, we'll go uh, the people in the, uh, support. Uh, and then also, uh, I'll just briefly summarize what we talked about earlier. Uh, if anybody submitted a letter, you know, uh, please just reference it rather than reading it. Uh, and then um, 
uh, you know, if you can, uh, you know, if you want to call anything out additional to that, that's fine. Uh, if a speaker before you has made points that, uh, you know, you want to uh, make, maybe you can just state that the, uh, you support their testimony and add anything new. Uh, so we'll try to be very efficient uh, and um, we'll try to follow uh, the time uh, restrictions uh, that Attorney Boone has uh, outlined. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, we'll open it up for public testimony. And first up is those in support. Uh, Iris, would you like to uh, give the names of anybody who would like to testify tonight in uh, support? Certainly, um, Dan Anderson, I'll move him over. Uh, I don't see him. If you can just let us know when we're ready, Iris. He's in there. Right. Good evening, Mr. Anderson. Would you like to state your name and address for the record? And then and please uh, let us know if there's any organizations that you represent. Uh, Mr. Anderson, if you're uh, with us, uh, you may be on mute if you'd like to unmute. Let's try it again. I can see him now. Okay, good. Uh, good evening, Mr. Uh, Anderson. Uh, if you would like to uh, give your name and address for the record and any uh, any uh, organizations that you represent, and then uh, go, you can go ahead and unmute. Uh, yes, I'm Dan Anderson. I'm at 4900. Upper Drive. So, could I get my testimony now? Yeah, just for a point of clarification, you represent the organization? Um, no, I'm I'm a the chair of the, the Lake Grove Neighborhood Association, but we have not come up with a resolution. Thank you for that clarification. Like okay, yeah, proceed. Yeah, I live about 300 feet um, from the property and on Upper Drive and. I'm in favor, I'm supporting this measure. I think it's a strong need for the city and neighborhood to have more affordable housing. Um, I, there's been concerns about traffic, but most of the traffic I think will be directed to um, the corridor, Boone's Ferry. Uh, and, and also having this development would also help with the uh, commercial and businesses along the street, and there's also access to public transportation. So I think um, it's a very good place to have high, higher density housing. Um, I think the main concern with the homeowners um, nearby would be just make sure that there's a buffer zone between the, um, the housing and, and the single family residences. And that's just to make things brief, that's all I'm gonna say. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, Commissioner, is there any questions for Mr. Anderson? I don't. Uh, Commissioner Fisher, yes. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know if it's a question, um, but in the future, if the people can show us on the map where their property is, it would help us. Uh, at least it helped me uh, show where they are in relation to the property. So. Yeah, in the vicinity, vicinity maps, I'm in the lower right-hand corner of, of that. Um, I don't see the map on the screen, but um, yeah, that's where I'm at. All right, thank you. Uh, commissioners, any other questions? Oh, I see none. Thank you, Mr. Anderson, for your testimony tonight. You're welcome. Iris, would you would like to call the next person that's uh, in support? Mm. 
okay, just a moment. Don Wayne. I see Mr. Wayne has been moved over. Mr. Wayne, if you'd like to state your name and address for the record and any organization you wish to represent. My name is, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Don Wayne. I live at uh, 1491 Coalwood, K is in Kansas, O-A-W-O-D Drive, uh, 97034. Uh, I'm not representing an organization. Although I am a member of but some Lake Oswego organizations. Thanks, please go ahead and give your testimony. Uh, I speak in support of the proposed amendments. I'll base my support on two factors, one historic and one practical, uh, both involving unmet needs in the city's uh, housing. First, the historic, the fact that Lake Oswego has a history of preventing equity and diversity first during the uh, post-World War II period in the era of legal discrimination by means of restrictive covenants or redlining, and later in the form of pragmatic economic factors that discriminated against the same populations that had not been affected by the earlier legal restrictions, but for other reasons, for example, not being able, their families not having been able to build equity in real estate in a middle-class neighborhood previously, they were also discriminated with against. Uh, th and there's, there's been a lot about this history recently, so I'm not going to say more about it. Some other people who are testifying today may say something about it. My second point has to do with a practical one, today's economy. <clears throat> Members of our community who work in essential public service areas, first responders such as police, firefighters, and healthcare workers, teachers, librarians, and others who've been priced out of the housing market in the city they serve need to be uh, assisted. I propose that some priority be given to such public service, servants not only as a benefit to them, but as a benefit to the rest of us since research has shown that such public employees are better able to serve the communities in which they work if they also live there themselves. Um, among other uh, factors, uh, they have a more personal, they're likely to have a more personal stake um, on, the, on behalf of their families and the quality of life of the community. There's also a need for affordable housing for senior citizens in Lake Oswego, many of them already longtime residents now on fixed incomes, who are faced with having to leave their homes either because of rent increases or if they are homeowners because of frequent reassessments and property taxes. The city is in a pivotal moment in its history and while we benefit from some of the initiatives such as the Parks and Recreation and Aquatic Center, we need also to pay attention to the timely issues of diversity and equity and to the needs of working people who provide essential services that we should not take for granted and to the needs of our senior, senior citizens. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Wayne. Uh, commissioners, any questions for Mr. Wayne? I see none. Thank you, Mr. Wayne. Thank you. Iris, the next person that would like to testify uh, in support. Okay, the next person is Ed Bettencourt. Uh, good evening, Mr. Uh, Bettencourt. If you'd like to state your name and address for the record and then any organization you wish to represent. Uh, you may uh, give your testimony. Okay, good evening. My name is Ed Bettencourt. My address is 4663 Trillium Woods, Lake Oswego. My wife and I have lived here for 10 years. Uh, our location is east of Boone's Ferry Road off of Oak Ridge Road. We have become increasingly concerned over our 10 years here about the lack of affordable housing uh, in our community. Tonight, you're taking public comment on this, and I thank you for that. And I wanna say, I support the proposal wholeheartedly. One of the city's goals is affordable housing. Having affordable housing is one way to increase the diversity of our community and to help the city develop a more inclusive culture. 
The City Council is presently listening to the community and working with its DEI advisory board to address these issues. It is doing this to improve Lake Oswego and assure it is a place where all people can live safely and comfortably. Addressing housing costs is crucial to achieving a city, to achieving a city whose citizens honor diversity, equity, and inclusion, and where all are welcome. It is detrimental to a community when people who work in that community cannot afford to live in it. That is a problem for many in Lake Oswego, including teachers, police, city employees, other people who work in city offices, and many, of course, in the service industry, who have been so important to maintaining life in the community during the past pandemic. We must begin to address aggressively address this serious issue. More people who work in this community, as well as those who want to move here from elsewhere, must have more options when seeking work and a place to live in our community. I support allowing multifamily housing as an allowed use in the WLG OC zone. As residents of this community, my wife and I recommend the adoption of this proposal. Having affordable housing in this area, which is our neighborhood, would be very beneficial for our neighborhood and our community. It would provide housing options for people that are presently unable to reside in Lake Oswego because of the high cost of real estate. It would be a very welcome addition to our neighbor and we laud Lake Oswego's support of this type of development across the city. Thanks for your time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bittencourt. Uh, Commissioners, any questions? None, uh, thank you. Iris, uh, could we please uh, call the next person and support? That was the last person in support. Okay, thank you. Uh, so next is uh, Attorney Boone had outlined, uh, we'll move to those who are in opposition. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'm not sure if we'll get to it tonight, but uh, after that, there would be those who would uh, give testimony who are neither uh, for nor against. Uh, but uh, now we'll hear from those uh, who are uh, in opposition. Uh, so Iris, could we please call uh, the first person uh, who is in opposition? Catherine Bell. Hi, Ms. Bell. Uh, if you'd like to state your name and address for the record and any organization you wish to support, you may give your testimony. Uh, my name is Kathy Bell. I live at 5188 Madrona Street. And I am ceding my time tonight to Helen Tricky Bradley. Uh, instead of reading the letter that I wrote uh, yesterday and submitted in opposition to this proposal. All right, thank you, Ms. Bell. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Uh, Commissioner Fisher, do you have a Just question? For, uh, Attorney Boone, did you say that, that people are not allowed to cede their time? No, they're, they're allowed to cede their five minutes. What I said was they can't cede a portion of their five minutes, like any remaining time to some other speaker. So you can't cede two minutes of my remaining time to somebody else. Thank you. So I'll um, move Helen over. Yes, Helen with us, Cyrus? Yes, she is. Good evening, uh, Helen. Uh, if you'd like to state your name and address for the record. Hi, uh, yes, thank in, you. In any organization you wish to represent too, if you could state that. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. My name is Helen Tricky Bradley, and I live at 5211 West Sunset Drive. I'm approximately 150 feet away from this proposed uh, location. Um, I'm speaking tonight in opposition to the passage of this application. Uh, a build of this density on my single family home street would be devastating. I have children who every day run up and down West Sunset Drive. It's a narrow street with no sidewalks or street lights and a massive traffic increase would make that impossible to do safely. The noise and exhaust from increased traffic would seriously impact the livability of my quiet neighborhood, turning it into a loud exhaust filled and dangerous road right outside my front door. 
I'm also extremely concerned about the parking and the lack of parking in any proposal that would make my street a parking lot. On page eight of the city staff report, policy B10, you did not bother to address the serious concerns of our neighborhood, considering the policies already met. Let's look at, at number F, and in which I'll quote from the uh, city staff report, quote, assurance of privacy and quiet for future residents and abutting properties. Placing a huge apartment building right alongside one of the busiest streets in Lake Oswego, Boonesbury <laughs> Road, does not sound quiet to me. And I know that living next to a 54 family apartment complex is certainly going to be loud. How could it not be? I live 150 feet away, like I said before. Our neighbors, the Olson family, live only 63 feet away from where this mammoth housing complex could be built. And here's another one that got to me in the staff report. It's, it's letter H, it's, and I'll quote, buffering and screening from adjacent uses and streets. I didn't see any adequate buffering in the city's prototype of a possible build, and you chose not to address this in your staff report, so how can we be assured? It's disingenuous to say that the policy is met when you've done nothing to show us it's possible given the large build. But here's the one that really gets me, and it's letter K in the staff report. Quote, you are required to, quote, minimize and or mitigate adverse traffic impacts generated by new development on adjacent neighborhoods. Again, the city chose not to address this, considering the traffic question already met. But how is this possible? How could the city possibly know the impact on traffic in our quiet neighborhood streets and on Boone's Ferry Road? You didn't do a comprehensive traffic study. And a Kittleson report does not replace a full-blown traffic study. You didn't do it. And um, you compl completely sidestepped an analysis of vehicular access points that is crucial to the understanding of how traffic flow from a major multifamily build would flow into residential streets. On page 17 and 18 of the staff report, you stated that you don't have to address traffic safety at this point, but you are required to consider it. And approval of this zoning change would have a significant impact on trip generation. And we demand the required full traffic study to be done now. On page nine of the staff report, policy C1, the standards require, quote, new development to enhance the existing built environment in terms of size, scale, bulk, color, materials, and architectural design. A towering, and you're asking for a height variance, high density apartment complex is incompatible with the look and feel of our single family home neighborhood. This application is not well thought out. It is not the result of careful study or compatible with the Lake Grove Design District Plan. And I ask for a continuance uh, for this for this hearing. Thank you so much. I, I can't hear you. I can't hear you, Gary. I can't hear anything. Can you hear me, Helen? Yes, I can. Yeah, hear you. I think other, others may be muted. Oh, uh, thank you, uh, Director Siegel. I think that may have been my fault. Uh, <laughs> uh, Ms. Bradley, um, one question. Uh, when uh, the staff gave the uh, earlier report and they talked about uh, this traffic study, they mentioned uh, you know a daycare as an example uh, and um, compared uh, that type of. Uh, uh, office commercial use, uh, a daycare to what's being proposed. Uh, any thoughts on that? Your and, and, and how the, yeah. I do have thoughts. I do have thoughts. I feel like that's disingenuous. A daycare is not something that, that would be on our street. We're, we're looking at, at both sides and we have a Renaissance home office building. And on the other side of the, of the street of West Sunset along Boone's Ferry, we have office buildings. And back below behind is where all the housing goes. So a high density, a high traffic daycare center is 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 the absolute worst scenario that you could possibly put in there, and it's not it's not likely, and that's not what we're up against. When when we talk about fifty to fifty four families, and the amount of trips that they are going to be taking at all days you know days of the week and all times, having children going to school, all of that wear and tear on my street, I you know. We, we, we want um, low income, I want low income housing. I, I voted for it. Um, I, I, I care about it in my neighborhood. And this density is the problem. It's, it's, it's sheerly, it's madness to put that number of people at the head of our very quiet, very narrow 
um, low, like um, single family home residents. It's just, uh, it's unconscionable. All right, thank you. Thanks. I see no other questions uh, from uh, commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Fisher. Can I please ask that we lower the rhetoric? When you use words like disingenuous, maddening, un, you know, unconscionable, it takes away from the work that I think the city's planning commission is doing. Uh, the staff here is probably some of the most professional people I've ever seen. And to make those kind of statements is very upsetting to me. I see what they do. I appreciate what they do. If you disagree, there's a way of doing it respectfully without all those uh, words. I, please, I, if you have a disagreement and, and it's legitimate to have a disagreement, express it, say what you like. For example, if you think the traffic study was incorrect and you'd like another one, that's one thing. But to, to use that kind of language, let's tone it down, please. I respectfully, may I say something? Sure. Hi. Thank you for your, for your uh, response, but I respectfully disagree. This is impacting my neighborhood. This is impacting my children. And this report was woefully inadequate. I'm offended <laughs> that the city Put, put forth such an inadequate report. And so, um, excuse me if I'm, if I'm, well, don't excuse me. I, I, this is my rhetoric. This is, this is how I'm representing myself. So thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, commissioners, no other questions I see. Iris, would you like to call the next person in opposition? Oh, thank you, Ms. Bradley, for your testimony tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, the next person is Carolyn Krebs. Uh, Ms. Krebs, I'll wait till she joins. Okay. Good evening, Ms. Krebs. If you'd like to state your name and address for the record and any organization you may wish to represent, you may give your testimony. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, my name is Carolyn Krebs. I'm at 16925 Deddy Court. And I'm pre presenting testimony for the Lake Forest Neighborhood Association tonight. Um, I authored this testimony, which was then approved by a vote of the association board. I have been involved in planning efforts in Lake Grove for the past 20 years. I served as a neighborhood representative for the development of the Lake Grove Village Center plan. This nine month commitment evolved into a three year effort to unite the visions of residents businesses and commercial property owners. While I was not directly involved in the development of the Westlake Grove Design District Plan, I am aware that it too went through an extensive and similar public process. In conjunction with work on the Lake Grove Village Center Plan, I served on committees for both Boons Ferry Road refinement studies and was co-chair of the project advisory committee for the Boons Ferry Road project. I'm invested in the shared vision for the west side of Lake Oswego and through my work, I've gained awareness of the many compromises that it takes to support a consensus for community vision. One of the greatest risks to a shared vision is when we remove our glasses and think we see well enough. I ask the Planning Commission to be cautious and consider the unintended consequences of tonight's application by the city. Zone changes and code amendments should be made to clear a high bar. I oppose the city's application. Specifically, I oppose changes to the comprehensive plan map and zoning map for portions of three lots from WLG R2.5 and WLG RMU to WLG OC and amendments to the community development code to establish area of residential use allowance in the WLG OC zone. The Westlake Grove Design District is intended to provide a transition from commercial areas in the Southwest Overlay District to the West and the more intensive commercial uses for the Lake Grove Village Center to the East. LOC 50020021HII states that the purpose of the Westlake Grove zones is, quote, to provide zoning for townhome residential, commercial, and mixed use development in the Westlake Grove District and to accommodate lower intensity commercial public facility and residential uses. 
and to provide a transition between the Lake Grove Village Center and adjacent residential neighborhoods. The intent is to supply, supply services to the market area that is comprised of adjacent neighborhoods, end quote. The intersection of West Sunset and Booth Ferry Road is the commercial center of the West Lake Grove Design District. And the plan shows through the zoning that all four corners are, are to support a mix of professional, office, and neighborhood commercial uses. The West Lake Grove Design District was never intended for high density residential development, especially in the WLGOC zone where no residential development is permitted outright or conditionally. However, high density residential is permitted outright in the Lake Grove Village Center general commercial zone. And the planning commission should consider that this is consistent with the vision for the West Lake Grove design district as a transition area. This is not a mistake. This is by design. The city would ask that we take off our glasses and equate exceedingly small parts of the properties under consideration. Excuse me. Those areas that are currently zoned WLG 2.5 or WLG RMU with R0 high density residential development and call it close enough. The neighborhood knows better than that and so do you. On page four of the staff report, there is a figure showing existing zoning of the site. The figure shows that the zoning of WLG R2.5 on West Sunset for the property under consideration tonight mirrors the zoning across the street. So let's be clear, it was intentionally zoned this way and not a mistake to correct. Further, the zoning of WLG MU, RMU on 16759 Boons Ferry Road was also designed to mirror WLG R2.5 zoning across Boons Ferry Road. So the seventh tree is unmistakable. The zoning was by design. Changing the zoning now undermines the plan and the balance of compromises between property owners. Any zone change should go through an extensive public process involving impacted stakeholders. The process employed to date by the city has lacked balance. On May 4th, the neighborhood meeting was held. Exhibit, exhibit F003 provides the summary from this meeting. And on page two of seven, the city staff was asked, quote, does the city think they will need to apply for a variance on the building height requirement? The answer was, the direction from city council was that we were supposed to work within current standards regarding the number of stories, density, landscaping, et cetera. So why do you think the city council made this restriction? I believe it was because they intend that future development at this site follow the same code that other property owners need to and have followed without exception. So the city goes on to say, quote, that being, that being said, the Westlake Grove standards are currently being examined for consistency and more contemporary building standards that are more sustainable and economical. So to clarify what this, this meant, a follow-up question was asked of the Lake Grove Business Association representative at this meeting. And we were told that the Business Association was not looking at massing and heights, et cetera. But the city continued to go on. The point of the study is to ensure that there are design options that are feasible that still meet the goals of the district. The study showed that there, that there are areas to develop uh, there are ways to develop approximately 50 multifamily units on the property under existing development standards. So what the city was referring to was the development capacity site study that is shown in a PowerPoint in great detail. The study was a red herring presented to distract us from the issue of looking at the zone change and potential code amendments objectively. The city was not forthcoming that they were looking at changing the design standards for height on this property until they met the next day with housing stakeholders. The city council asked for staff to work within existing standards, not, and that does not mean with extra height allowance. On May 5th, the city met with housing stakeholders and the, the narrative continues to evolve. The question was asked, if all you need is five extra feet of height to make the desired design more attainable, why not add extra five feet to the site building height maximum as part of the community development code amendments proposed? The answer was the extra five feet could make the design more livable with taller ceilings and ground floor office or commercial space. 
It may not be noticeable from neighboring properties. The design study assumed nine foot ceilings. However, the cruiseway apartments, apart, other apartments in the area were about eight feet, which would overall save three feet of heights. So the initial study, the initial study that they had in the PowerPoint had a building height of approximately 40 feet where 35 feet is allowed in the WLG OC zone. So this answer tells me that the addition of five feet is not re requisite to the design illustrated in the study, a design the city is clearly using to make their case for their code amendment. In the city of Lake Oswego comprehensive plan land use E3C XVII, it states, quote, proposed comprehensive plan slash zone map amendments shall demonstrate public need for the change and that the proposed amendment will best meet identified public needs versus available alternatives, end quote. This provision of the comprehensive plan was missed by staff and absolutely applies here. The Lake Grove Village Center General Commercial Zone allows for 45 feet maximum height and permits R0 use and is an alternative to consider before a zone change. Since the staff was asked to work within current design standards, wouldn't it be prudent to look at alternative sites? The permitted height in Westlake Grove is 35 feet in all of the zones. We are asked to take off our glasses and agree that 40 feet is close enough. The height at the corner of Cruz and Boone's is 45 feet. Height is, very is a very important consideration and not just at at least 80 feet from all R75 zone properties as stated in the proposed development code amendment. When planning the Lake Grove Village Center, it was said, one one it was, we spent one year on height, one year on Boone's Ferry and one year on everything else. The community was still concerned about 45 feet at the time of adoption of the plan. I know that overall height is important and I believe you know it is also. I'd like to remind the Planning Commission that use of this site for an affordable housing project is not dependent on the city's ownership. The city must sell this property to reimburse the Boone's Ferry Road project when the construction staging site is no longer needed. The city can and should provide an alternative site to pursue an affordable housing project that doesn't require a zone change and this degree of site-specific planning. So thank you for consideration of this testimony. Can anybody, I can't hear anybody. Chair Heap, are you muted? I'm still here. I'm still unmuted. I think. I actually oh, don't see I, Chair Heap. I don't yeah. see Chair Heap still with us. Vice Chair. <laughs> Carolyn, thank you for your testimony while we wait for Chair Heap, I'll fill in. Uh, commissioners, are there any questions? Seeing no questions. Uh, There's a again, question. I'm sorry. I, I can not... see him. Fisher has his hands well, up. Commissioner Fisher has a question. Oh, oh of course. Commissioner Fisher. Uh, Ms. Krebs, uh, if, if somehow the, the zoning uh, created a, a 35 foot thing, uh, height creation, would the, would your organization be more amenable to it? Are you asking me if um, removing the extra five feet that's being asked in the community development code would change? Right. right. Well, first of all, I think, I think that's a difficult, I, I still believe that we need to be looking at alternative sites. This um, high density residential is not allowed in this zone and we're, our position is that it should not be, it should not be in the future. We have other sites where high density residential is allowed, lots of sites. So we don't need it here. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Bear with me. I can't see everybody, so I'll scroll through. Okay. Seeing no other questions, 
Iris, can we move on to the next? Certainly, um, Karen McFadden, I'll bring her over. Before we take this testimony, I think I see Mr. Heap coming back on. I wanna make sure we have uh, four commissioners. I'm counting. I, I see Chair Heap there, I'm not sure. Mr. Heap, is Dave Beckett? Uh, he seemed to have lost Dave well, Beckett. Deputy Attorney Boone, while we wait for Chair Heap to return, would it be best for us to? I take a short break pause. yeah i think we need to take a short break um because we need to have a quorum to continue yeah that would be important yeah okay so why don't we take a uh, five five minute recess does that work okay we'll take a five minute recess and uh readjourn here at uh 8 14.
So we're we're live. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry to everyone. We had a little bit of a technical glitch there. Uh, my computer, at least, I had a reboot and uh, rejoin. Recording in progress. Uh, so we would like to restart. Uh, Evan, if you'd like to give us some guidance on uh, how we handle the technical glitch, uh, I was able to hear about uh, you know two three minutes of uh, Ms. Krebs' uh, testimony, but please give us guidance on the proper procedure. Yeah, well, it, you know, occasionally we, have, unfortunately, we have these technical glitches. Um, in order for a commissioner in a quasi-judicial uh, proceeding to vote on the matter, they have to hear all of the testimony, right? Which means that before the vote can occur, the commissioners will need to review the tape of the testimony of those people when they dropped out. So Iris uh, will be happy to give you the links uh, to those so you can queue up uh, missing testimony. And then before the vote, uh, you would indicate that you had listened to the testimony that you, had, that you unfortunately had dropped out on uh, for the record. Sure, thank you. Commissioners, everything okay? I believe so. All right, uh, can we please proceed? Uh, is, is Christian there? I, I see, uh, all I see, I don't see his uh, camera anymore. Yeah, I believe. Vice Chair Pepe just has his camera turned off, but he's still there. Oh, yeah, no, I'm still here. Okay, I'm sorry. My internet's not that strong, so when it starts to get uh, touchy, I just turn my video off and it works just fine. I'm still here. So maybe one other point of order or question is whether um, Ms. Krebs had completed her testimony or if she'd used up her allotted time. I think we want to make sure that that's covered. I think I think she had about two minutes remaining on her allotted time. Also, oh, uh, Deputy Attorney Boone, would the suggestion then be to uh, allow Ms. Krebs to uh, use her remaining two minutes now? Well, I, I thought she had finished her testimony. Uh, it, that was my question, if she had yeah. finished her testimony. She said she's available to answer any questions. Okay, uh, we can start with questioning. Uh, commissioners, any questions for Ms. Krebs? I see none. All right, thank you, Ms. Krebs, for your testimony. Uh, at least myself and any other commissioners who uh, had a technical glitch there, uh, we will uh, review. Uh, the video recording uh, and follow up. So thank you. Uh, Iris, would you like to call the next person uh, in Sir, opposition? Karen McFadden. Uh, good evening, Ms. McFadden. Uh, if you'd like to state your name and address for the record in any organization, that you wish to represent, you may go ahead and give your testimony. I just saw a note, chat note that says she cannot unmute. So, Iris, can you do that? We got it. There we she got goes. it. We're here. Come here, Come here, Karen. Come here, Karen. She's coming from the other room. Here she is. Hi, good evening. I was trying to get through to you guys on my phone because I couldn't unmute. Uh, my name is Karen McFadden. My address is 5309 West Sunset Drive, and I am not here representing any entity. I am speaking in opposition to the proposal. I wanted to bring up two things. Um, the first being that in the report that I read dated June 10th, 2021, on the staff report, one of the concerns that was brought up was the um, the fact that there's a lot of danger in these areas for children surrounding the Boone's Ferry area on Washington Court at bus stops. And I personally, in my letter, did state that people frequently run the light at Sunset Drive and Boone's Ferry. I've personally been hit almost twice. Oh, uh, she, she, she's not. I'm sorry. Go ahead, just keep going. And um, I've seen two teens try to cross the street on the pedestrian green light and almost been hit in the last week. 
Um, in the staff report, it says that this is, I can't remember how it was stated, but outside of the scope of this meeting. And I just wanted to really say that I think that that's not a fair statement to consider that all the people that are gonna be possibly living in this high density uh, building, should it come to pass to discount the fact that you would be putting them and their children in danger. This is a busy street. I have seen too many close calls to be comfortable seeing that many people living on such a busy street. And I'd also like to take the opportunity to lead into one of the gentlemen who spoke in favor of this proposal as a way to increase equity and diversity within our community. And I would speak in strong opposition to that. I feel that adding a dense apartment complex to this dangerous and busy street plus in cruel way the people that you're inviting into our community by stuffing them in a corner that's 1.38 acres that would house 50 to 54 families where there are 28 families on the entire street of Sunset. And we have our own problems with our children being in danger, potholes, traffic, speeding, what have you. And to say that you're being equitable by inviting people into this community with affordable housing and then sticking them on a busy corner, to me is, is hurtful and insulting. And I understand the point that there are people that live in this community and that would like to live in this community that work here. And of course the buy-in of people living and working in the same community. I myself work on Lakeview Drive. I've been, wor I worked 20 years in Canby and I just started working in the community. And I certainly feel like I'm a greater part of the community and feel more vested now that I work in the same area that I live. However, I think that that really doesn't take into consideration the fact that there's a large amount of people that live on Sunset Drive that are already priced out of our neighborhood. Due to the fact that housing prices are exploding, we can't move out of this neighborhood and into another neighborhood in Lake Oswego because we can't afford it. We can barely afford the homes that we live in. And for you to put these people into tiny little apartments and tell them, look, we are providing you with a nice place to live that's near where you work. It's just, to me, really unkind. And to stuff them in this tiny little place where they can't safely walk to a park. And to completely discount the schools because this is not part of the scope of what you are considering is, again, not fair to the families that live there. They care about their children and their schools. They all care about having more than 30, 35 children in a classroom in both Lake, Lake, sorry, River Grove and Lake Grove. And I realize that this is a zoning meeting, but since everyone else is discussing One minute. other things, thank you. Other things in this discussion, I feel that it's okay to bring this up. Um, I understand that there's a disagreement about whether a profit, profit, excuse me, proper traffic study has been done. I'd be interested in that. I also am not aware of any kind of a air pollution study that's been done. The example that was given of considering a daycare as well as a restaurant on that to compare to 50 to 54 families, I believe is not an accurate comparison. As someone who's well-versed in math, that just doesn't add up for me. And I don't think it adds up for any of the people who are in opposition to this. I thank you for your time. And I invite you to come and look at the site that you are proposing to put this building or buildings on and really take a look at the neighborhood and the parking that's available and the way that people speed down the street and really reconsider the fact of what you're trying to do to the people that would live here and make this their home. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Have a great night, everybody. All right. Thank you, Ms. McFadden, for the testimony. Commissioners, any questions? None? All right. I'd like to uh, move ahead. Uh, Iris, would you like to call the next person in opposition? 
The next person will be Ed, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name right, but Ed Vate Bogel. As, and Evan Boone here, Deputy State Attorney. As that person is getting ready to testify, let me just remind people who are using the chat that that function is not part of the record. And uh, so, so any statements in the chat are not uh, to be considered by the commission. Uh, and the, if you want any substantive matters in the chat to be considered, you'll need to submit that in writing to the commission for the record. Iris, were we, were we able to move the next uh, person? Let's try again. Hold on. Okay. Okay. Hello. Good evening. Uh, if I sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, Mr. Ogale. Ogale. Adoit Ogale. Ogale. Thank yeah, you, thank Mr. You Oakley. Your, uh, uh, if, if you please state your name and address for the record and any organization you wish to represent, and then go ahead and give your testimony. Sure, sounds good. Uh, I am Adwait Ogley. I live with my wife, Crystal Wheeler, at 16675 Bonaire Avenue, uh, which is west of the proposed lot. Uh, we had sent an email uh, stating our uh, opposition to the proposal, but the only two things I wanted to state right now was that I was listening into the comments from both Carolyn and Karen, and they ring very true. It is quite a different situation for the people who live here. Uh, my family has absolutely no opposition to low income housing. I welcome uh, anyone should get the opportunity, but it is not the low income, it is the population density that is the problem. Uh, any such uh, design for low income or affordable housing should consider the impact on the people who are already living in the neighborhood. And also these site specific zone changes that are not gonna apply to the West Lake Grove district, they just don't sit well with us. Uh, that's all I wanted to add in addition to the points that my wife had sent in email as well as I did. Uh, thanks again for consideration. Uh, it, it's good to uh, it's good to pa participate and thank you for giving us the time. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Ogilvy. Uh, Commissioners, any other questions? None? All right, thank you. Uh, Iris, would we please call the next uh, person in opposition? Certainly, Jesse Weichels. Uh, good evening, uh, uh, Jesse. Uh, if you'd like to state your name and address for the record uh, in any organization you wish to represent, you may go ahead and give your testimony. Hi, my name is actually Emmy Spenlinhauer. My husband is Jesse Wychulis, and he is currently putting our children to bed, and he will be ceding his time to uh, to Thomas Cutler. Did anybody hear that? Oh, yes, yeah, I think we heard it, but maybe we can just have okay. the deputy attorney uh, comment on the uh, procedural oh, that's, that's, question. That, that's fine. He can see the, five, the full five minutes to Thomas Cutler. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Wait, Steve, how, oh, sorry, I missed it. Uh, deputy Attorney Boone said that uh, the request is granted to uh, transfer the uh, time uh, to uh, the person uh, you mentioned. Fantastic. Thank you. So I'll promote Thomas. Um, just a moment. Oh, good evening, Mr. Cutler. If you'd like to state your name and address for the record and any or organization you wish to represent, you may go ahead and give your testimony.
So, Mr. Cutler, you're on mute. Sorry about that. No problem. My name is uh, Thomas Cutler. I'm an attorney with uh, Cutler Law Group, LLC. I represent uh, Jesse and Emmy that you just heard from. And um, I would like to just quickly address- I'm sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt Go you, Evan Boone, Evan Boone here. So Mr. Cutler, since you represent uh, uh, Jesse and Emmy, uh, you, you're not speaking on your own behalf, so, which is fine. So really it's either Jesse or Emmy is speaking and then one of them is seated the time to the other. So is it, uh, is it uh, the gentleman's name, Jesse? Uh, I believe he said that the wife was, um, Emma was ceding the time to you. So we'll make Jesse being the attendee and then you're representing uh, Jesse. I, I, believe, I, I believe I will be seated a total of 10 minutes. Um, if, if not right now, I will eventually have 10 minutes, but it's the sequence oh, you, yeah, of you, the time you that there ten, appears. You have 10 minutes to speak on behalf of Jesse. Wonderful. He was, he was seated five minutes from his wife. And okay. so that gives him a total of 10 and you're speaking for him. So, okay. Okay. Just to clarify who you're representing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. So um, first of all, thank you so much for this opportunity to, to be with you tonight. I, I share, first of all, I share the, the, the feeling and sentiment that I have nothing but respect for the city staff. I have nothing but respect for the city attorney. It's been a little while since I've uh, handled the matter with you folks, but I know what good people you are and, and what a good job you try to do for the city and, and for the citizens. What I'm very concerned about in this situation is it's a perfect storm. It, it's, a, it's a situation that begs an improper application of the law to the facts. Um, we've got a situation where the, the property is owned by the city. What is the likelihood that a parcel that's owned by the city for a road project just happens to be the optimal or, or great candidate for a low income housing project. I'm also incredibly sympathetic to the idea that we need low income housing and I applaud the efforts to try to provide low income housing and all kinds of housing for the city and its residents. But again, the question is, is it suitable or appropriate or optimal for this particular parcel? And is it fair to the adjoining residents to have their neighborhood completely bear the brunt of 54 units, regardless of, of income level? And I think Mr. Ogali uh, said it very well. This is not about anyone opposing low income um, residents. This is about, is it appropriate to have an abrupt change from with no transition, no adequate buffering, no, no transitional zoning that would buffer this area from the effects of multifamily high density. There are some procedural issues that I raised in a letter that I submitted that are also kind of tie into this notion that if you've already got an, an MOU signed and the city is very committed about this property that they have, there's kind of a foregone conclusion idea to this that, that circumvents the normal procedures that usually apply. In, if this is a major, uh, major land use application or, or major development application, there's supposed to have been a pre-app conference. There's supposed to have been city manager approval, not just, not just approval from, from Mr. Siegel. Um, so again, applaud the, the city's efforts, applaud the staff's efforts, but procedurally that's what it, and those are procedural requirements i know in the introduction of the staff report it talks about well maybe the substantive standards don't apply i don't agree with that either i think subsection 15 does apply um subsection you know 50.07.003-15 is the re review criteria for major developments i think it has to apply because it can't be on the one hand it's not, a, it's not a legislative decision, therefore legis legislative uh, standards don't apply, but it's also not a major, devel major development application, therefore those, those criteria don't apply. That would mean that it has less scrutiny than if, if it, it, it's supposed to be higher scrutiny because it's focusing on a, a small group of, of parcels rather than 
a comprehensive study of all of the lands and all of the, the, the available inventories. It's supposed to be a higher scrutiny, not a lesser, and so we can't just disregard those, those substantive standards. But even if we're, we were only looking at the procedural standards that apply, we've got to at least be consistent. Now we might say, oh, well, it's the city that's the applicant and, and the city that's reviewing it, why have a, a meeting with itself? Well, it's one department conferring with another and, and with their experts, and that might have been very beneficial in this case. There might have been a, a better discussion about what, what level of traffic study uh, needed to be ordered. There could have been better um, discussion about which approval criteria apply. I was very disappointed, I think is the, the, the language I, I would use, um, very disappointed to see so many references. If I, as I added them up, there were more instances in which it was noted that the application materials doesn't address the approval criteria. There were more that said that it didn't address it as those that did address it. In my experience and all my years of, of land use you know, work, that would just be a, a, a bounce application. That would be a rejected application. You know, thank you very much, but please come back with, a, with an application that addresses all of the approval criteria. So it's difficult for, and I don't think it's appropriate uh, for staff to step in and say, well, we'll try to find some justifications, even though it is the city that's the decision maker and the, and, and the applicant, there needs to be a higher level of, uh, of circumspect behavior in that regard so that it avoids the appearance of self-dealing or the appearance of conflict of interest. I think we need to be completely transparent and showing how it is that this parcel meets all of the approval criteria and it's not just the coincidence that the city owns it. Um, a similar concern relates to the traffic study. Again, a, a good pre-application conference might have spelled out, well, let's, let's really look at what the impacts might be and what level of traffic study. It's not just the comprehensive uh, or, or the statewide planning goal 12, it, that is applicable as well, but there's also a code section that is um, in the city's own code. If we look at the con connected community policies and we look at policy C-6, it says require applicants for zone change requests and conditional use permits to determine the resulting extent of impacts to the transportation system and provide mitigation deemed appropriate by the city to maintain transportation, transportation system efficiency. Now, that's whether or not there's an accompanying development application. In other words, if there's just a zone change application, that is, it's required to study the traffic impacts. And it's simply not, it's not fair to say that, well, we're going to try to um, characterize a worst case, reasonably worst case scenario as a child care center and a restaurant. The scale and scope of that child care center would have to be larger and, and more significant than any, any other application that I'm aware of for a child care center in, in Lake Oswego. I don't think that's a reasonable analysis or, or comparison, but even if it were, it still would not solve the question of whether there's an impact, a, any negative impact, a significant impact. There is a significant impact when you look at point of access analysis. If these are businesses, they're much more likely to be fronting Boone's Ferry and have a, a, you know, alternate access, maybe two access to Boone's Ferry and not dump them out onto West, West Sunset. If this is a apartment complex, you're gonna to want to have that, you know, at least it even shows on, on the mock-up drawing that one of the access dumps right out onto to Sunset within a half a block of the intersection. That creates a nightmare for both the people trying to get out and the people coming up from the, from the neighborhood. It gets congested. There's, there, someone has to leave a, a gap or the people can't get out of the apartment camp complex. It's too close to that, that intersection. And I don't see any analysis of, well, let's see. Yeah, I, if the standard is it has to be no significant impact to not have to do a full-blown traffic study, then you'd have to ignore that very big question of, wait a minute, what about the orientation of, and, and the location of the, of the, the, the uh, vehicular traffic access? So I think that 
it need there needs to be it needs to be referred back to city staff needs to be referred back to the experts to fully flesh out the the um, narrative so that it addresses how it is that so the citizens can all see how it how it, it complies with with these criteria but also a full-blown traffic study because I, until we see what those impacts really would be and and whether it can really bear this kind of uh 54 you know that the, the impact and the trips that would be generated from 54 residential units dwarfs the vast majority of of commercial uses that might be put especially when you're talking about the orientation of the of the access to to boone's ferry finally i have worked in Lake Oswego and worked, you know, within a few blocks of this, of this intersection, you know, for over, over 10 years, over 12 years. And I know how busy that street is. I know how, how small the, the West Sunset is. Again, not, not built out, not, no, no pedestrian um, cir circulation there, no, no sidewalks, but this really is a safety issue in, in, in my view for the residents that you would put in that in that parcel. You're t it's a, there's a huge difference between, even if you took th this non-reasonable worst case scenario of a, a uh, child care facility, that child care facility by definition would have complete and total supervision of each of the children that are dropped off there. And there would be no risk that, oh, they're gonna you know, escape and run out to the street. If you are talking about an apartment complex, especially as this drawing shows, it shows one going out to the, the, the frontage there of, of Boone's Ferry, a, a driveway opening. If you've got a driveway opening, then you're going to have kids that are young, young kids. And, and, and you know, some of them, I had a, a three-year-old end up in the middle of my street because he uh, was able to stand up on a chair and unlock the deadlock and run out into the street and, and had to run out there and rescue them. It happens. These things happen when, when you have young kids. So those kinds of scenarios would have to be addressed in any kind of you know uh, development application going forward. Yes, but it should be addressed now so that we can uh, identify whether this is even possibly a suitable location. Which which ties into my last legal point, and that is there's no analysis for other sites. It's it's reference to the OAR section, the only OAR section that, that's referenced in the in the materials is OAR 660-008-0010. That analysis in the staff report uh, just basically makes the, the leap that well, since we since we don't have enough already zoned in inventory that could uh, um, um, be for multifamily high, high density, then we are immediately looking to this site. No, the question is, are there other sites available that could be rezoned? That's the appropriate alternate sites analysis. And I don't see any analysis of that whatsoever. Again, it's just a fundamental flaw that we need to send back to staff and, and, and have them flesh out for us and have the experts fill in the gaps on that before we can even adequately review this and certainly shouldn't be sending it on to the city council. Thank you so much for your time and, and for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cutler. Uh, commissioners, any questions? Uh, Commissioner Fisher. Yeah, it's not so much for Mr. Cutler. Uh, he raises some interesting legal issues. This is procedural in terms of what we're doing right now. Are we just listening to testimony or are we asking for, for example, are there responses to what Mr. Cutler is raising? I assume there are. Um, at this point, at the end of testimony, will we be able to uh, talk about uh, responses to the issues raised? Well, you can ask Mr. Cutler uh, any questions you want to, and then you'll hear from persons uh, who are neither for nor against, and then the applicant will have an opportunity for rebuttal. And at that point, then the testimony, you know, then the period is closed, and then you would be moving to liberation. And that assumes you all complete this tonight, which is unlikely, so it could string out a little bit. But, but the concept is, uh, in the quasi-judicial hearing, this is the time to ask your questions of the, of the presenter, um, and then the uh, other side, in this case, the, the city being the applicant, 
but have a chance in rebuttal to respond to these questions, these issues. That, that's really what I wanted to know if there's a rebuttal and there, there is, so thank you. All right, I see no other questions from commissioners. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cutler. Iris, would you please call the next person in opposition? Thank you very much. Certainly. Okay, the next person is um, Emmy Spenlenhauer. Thank you, uh, Ms. Spenlenhauer. If you'd like to state your name and address for the record, any organization you represent, you may go ahead and give your testimony. Um, Ms. Spenlenhauer, we cannot hear you. Uh, I'm unmuting. So we can hear you now, yes. Hi, my name is Emmy Spellenhauer. I live at 5287 West Sunset Drive. I am, I didn't measure it, but I'm within 300 feet because I had to be notified of everything going on. Um, I am a very concerned citizen. Um, it appears to me that the city is trying to push this through without doing the necessary research to make an informed decision about a spot zone. Since I have no doubt from the beginning that you would try to push this through and fast track it based solely on popular phrases like low income housing, these hot button phrases get people fired up and very supportive. And I support low income housing too. I do have a problem with the location of this as Thomas Cutler just pointed out and other people have pointed out. I do not feel that sticking a 50 unit complex on 1.3 acres in a planned medium density neighborhood is keeping in line with our Westlake Grove planning code commission. I'm, I don't have the words right there, but I think you know what I'm going for. Um, you haven't proven to me or anybody that I've talked to in the neighborhood that this will not impact us. I do feel that a full traffic study or report, I forget which it's called, needs to be done to really assess how this will impact the neighborhood streets. Um, I wanna know where all the cars are gonna park. I also have really big safety concerns. Um, no green space planned in the mock-ups. How are these people walking to Waluga Park? There's a new light right there that is an extremely narrow street. I have three boys. Even before I had kids, I avoided walking on Waluga. That is a narrow street to get to the park. There's no green space planned. Where are these kids playing? Um, I have reviewed the information provided in the staff report and it's apparent to me that the application for the spot zone change is incomplete. It is missing plenty of criteria. Um, it does not have the traffic report. It is apparent to me that the spot zone change, it appears disingenuous to those of us reading it that live here. Um, and the city manager did not sign off that he should have done. Um, I mean, a lot of my other points, I'm gonna just reiterate what other people said, so I won't waste too many time other than uh, staff report E2, page 11 says, this land is not in a residential neighborhood and it will not affect the plan density designation. It is feet, feet from a medium density neighborhood. There's no way that this will not affect my density. Our schools, our elementary schools are already at capacity. Where are these kids gonna go to school? Where, where are my kids gonna then go to school? Am I gonna have to shuttle my kids across, across the city? This, this doesn't seem logical. Um, so while I am sympathetic to the need for more housing in Oregon and specifically affordable housing, it seems to me the city is desperate to satisfy state requirement of one kind or another and they're not thinking about the bigger picture of the impact a complex of this size will have in a single family neighborhood. I have another problem with the city not following the rules in submitting a complete application to itself. The city should have already completed a full, tra full traffic report, um, which I understand will take months. Um, but if another developer were coming in and trying to submit for a change, I would bet that they wouldn't have made it this far with an incomplete application. From where I sit, it seems the city is submitting an incomplete application to, accept, to itself. This seems extremely deceitful. 
and we need to hold our city officials and employees to the same standards and rules that everybody else has to follow. Thank you for your time. I can't hear anybody. Nobody has spoken yet. Sorry, Ms. Finland Howard, I thank you. I saw somebody's lips moving, but I couldn't hear anything. Yes, yeah, sorry, Ms. Finland Howard. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Commissioners, were there any uh, questions? I see none. Uh, so thank you, Ms. Finland Howard. Iris, would you like to call the next person in opposition? Certainly. Um, Chris Durkee. Hi, Mr. Durkee. If you'd like to state your name and address for the record and any organization you wish to represent, you can give your testimony. Yes, thank you. My name is Chris Durkee. I live at 2356 Glen Haven Road in the Palisades neighborhood, just southeast of the site, and I do not represent any organization. Um, I support the idea of low income housing, uh, multifamily housing on the site. I think it makes a lot of sense. I support the rezoning of the site. However, I'm opposed to the five foot variance uh, for two reasons. First, there is no actual project. There's no developer. There's no design concept. There's no financial plan. It would seem to me, rather than establish a height variance now, let's wait until the city sells the land to a developer or decides to develop it on their own and then develops a, uh, a plan and a strategy for the development. And then if that plan requires a five foot uh, height variance, let's evaluate that variance at the time. Based with all the, on the merits. issues that we've been having. I'm sorry? Oh, sorry for the interruption, uh, Mr. Durkee. Uh, go okay. ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think let's evaluate the height variance at the time when there's a real project, then we can evaluate it based upon the merits of that design concept in the context of the overall development rather than grant it now. The second reason that I oppose to the height variance is that the, um, well, I'm on Glenhaven uh, Road and right across the street is a, uh, an enormous two-story development that is um, going up. So I guess my, my sensitivity to the height issue is, is, is uh, peaked right now. I think I'm concerned that granting a variance now could set a precedent for future height variances to be granted on other uh, multifamily or mixed use projects. And especially considering that the city is the applicant, on what grounds would the city or the planning commission deny a five foot height variance to anybody else under similar circumstances when the planning commission granted it to the city under this proposal that you're, con you're considering. So I'm, I support the project, but I oppose the height variance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Durkee. Uh, commissioners, any questions? Uh, one question I have, Mr. Durkee, just to confirm, you said that you live in the Palisades Neighborhood Association, and it sounded like you were indicating that you were thought you were close to the property, or can you? No, no I'm okay. sorry if I, if I left that impression. We live on Glen Haven, which is right near Fernwood in South Shore, so we're, um, I don't know, probably a couple miles as the crow flies uh, or, or driving southeast of the site. Okay, thank you for the clarification, yeah, thank you. Uh, commissioners, any questions? I see none. All right, Iris, would you like to call the next person? Thank you, Mr. Jamie, Durkee. Jamie Howsley. Uh, good evening, uh, Jamie. If you'd like to state your name and address for the record, and then uh, any uh, organization you wish to represent and then uh, you may go ahead and give your testimony. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Heat, members of the Planning Commission. <clears throat> For the record, Jamie Housley, two Center Point Drive, 
Suite 600, Lake Oswego, 97035. Uh, okay. I'm the attorney for Renaissance Ventures, LLC. My client owns the office building immediately to the west of the proposed change along Boone's Ferry. And on behalf of our client, we're in opposition to this request and ask that the Planning Commission recommend a denial. Uh, we provided the Planning Commission with a letter outlining some of the issues that we see with the request uh, and, and able to not meet some of the applicable criteria. But rather than doing a, a deep dive specifically on those, I kind of wanted to just touch on the themes from that letter. Um, first, this is a spot zone. The Westlake Grove District was intended to foster commercial development and redevelopment. And our client invested a substantial amount of money to build an office building. And they are effectively sort of the initial, initial gateway to the West Lo Westlake Grove Employment District as you move uh, uh, eastward along Boone's Ferry, plopping a residential zoning down on this this land specifically here breaks up the office uses both on the the west side and the east side of, of um, the city's property. So plain and simple, this is a, a spot zone. Secondly, it's no secret that our client is a, a home building company, and I think Commissioner Pape asked an important question earlier about House Bill 2001 and House Bill 2003. The bottom line is that more housing is coming to local governments in the state of Oregon because of mandates from uh, our legislature. And of course, we, we advocate for more housing in, in, um, in our industry, but it needs to be in the right area. And that is where existing residential uses are. And that's what those bills are trying to focus in on, um, both in getting more affordable housing, more middle housing, um, but it needs to be in those areas that are, are presently zoned residential. Third, uh, we believe that this application is, a, a, is ahead of itself for this property. If the city wishes to surplus this property uh, because the Boone's Ferry Road project is coming to an end, they should attempt to surplus it under its current zoning. Uh, there is also a dearth of office land in the city. Uh, vacancies have dwindled partly due to the pandemic and a lot of businesses are moving to LLO. And I will state from uh, you know, my law firm, we're, we're currently trying to, to look uh, also back down at this area and it's, there, there isn't a lot of office land. So I believe that uh, this would be a very welcome thing there for any, any developer to take that risk. If there were no takers for the, the city's property under that current zoning, then that would be the appropriate time to circle back to look at doing something else such as a residential use. Finally, um, in our letter, we, we talk about the potential need for a good neighbor agreement. And this specifically goes to criteria uh, A to C from the comprehensive plan that talks about impacts to surrounding properties. Um, we would recommend that any a good neighbor agreement could be passed as part of a, a covenant as part of any surplus sale uh, from this property to any any developer. And basically, this comes down to a lot of issues already mentioned by some of the previous speakers, but it's also a daytime versus nighttime use here. Uh, you know, our client is has this uh, property for their their office use. They're there during the daytime and then, uh, you know, leave at you know, eight, eight to five is working hours and they're not present there the rest of the time. Uh, they would have significant concerns about their parking lot being uh, used for uh, excess parking. Um, we have concerns related to uh, potential damage to the, the, the property as a result of them not being there uh, off hours, as well as other security concerns. So um, I think that that would be something else to consider if, if the Planning Commission is so inclined to recommend well, approval for this, uh, you know, moving forward with the recommendation of uh, placing a good neighbor agreement as a covenant as part of any surplus would be a, a welcome thing. And with that, uh, I'll thank you for the opportunity to come here this evening and ask that you consider our letter that we submitted as well as the testimony this evening, and I'll be happy to entertain any questions you have. Well, thank you. Commissioners, any questions for Mr. Halsey? None. Thank you, Mr. Halsey. Thank you. Iris, could we please call the next person? Kim Olson. Uh, 
Well, good evening, Kim. Uh, if you'd like to state your name and address for the record in any organization you wish to represent, you may go ahead and give your testimony. Uh, we can't hear any audio. If you please unmute, Kim. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. My name is Kim Olson. I live at 5173 West Sunset Drive. I do not represent any organization. I'd like to cede my time to Jesse Spenlinauer. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Olson. Uh, Iris, just for a check, uh, we did have somebody on earlier, uh, Spinlin Howard. Is this somebody different? Yes, you had Emmy on. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Can you oh, see yeah. Yeah, Iris, we're just waiting to see if Iris can. Uh, I, I think admit. his last name is different. It's W Y C H U L E S. I'm sorry, I didn't realize they had different last names. So, mm -hmm. Jesse. Maybe a, maybe a point of order, one second here, because it did get a little confusing because uh, I think the names appeared uh, and then we had some other names said, no, no, somebody else. As a point of order, I'd like to check with staff and just make sure that we understand uh, who's testified previously and who are. Who are is now testifying. Uh, uh, yeah, Attorney Boone, I mean, could you help us in this? Well, I, my recollection is that Jesse, I'm just going to go by first names here, if I may, that, sure. that Emma ceded her five minutes to Jesse, and then Jesse's 10 minutes were testified by Thomas Cutler. So Mr. Cutler doesn't have any time left to cede to if he's not, and he can't represent you because he's not an attorney. So, I mean, he's spoken for 10 minutes and no person can speak for more than 10 minutes. So I think, well, Mr. Jesse, Jesse is now in chat saying, well, who did Mr. Cutler speak for? Kind of reading chats here. Uh, I think Mr. Cutler did speak on behalf of Jesse. However, I am ceding my time to Jesse. So Jesse will speak. Yeah, but but Jesse then, he's also been ceded five minutes by his, by Emma. And so that's 10 minutes then that, that Jesse has spoken and no person could speak for more than 10 minutes. So he's had his 10 minutes. So that was Emmy spoke. Emmy spoke on behalf no. of herself. No, she ceded her five minutes to Jesse and Jesse, was represented by Mr. Cutler. So Emmy didn't speak? Because I saw her speak. I'm sorry, I'm not. Um, my understanding was that uh, Emmy uh, was uh, succeeding her time as uh, Attorney Boone had mentioned uh to jesse and emmy and jesse's time was going to mr cutler that was my understanding for a total of 10 minutes and so that time was taken yeah and it looks like pardon me for interrupting but it looks like emmy did actually testify she after did. yeah <laughs> perhaps shouldn't have correct sorry for that all right so for a point of order i'd like to move on then uh to uh the next uh person in opposition i believe well, uh, unless kim olson wishes to speak on her own behalf Okay. Thank you. That's, that's fine. I've submitted my letters, so I feel comfortable that right. my topics have already been addressed. Thank you, though. Thank you. Vice Chair Pepe, did you have a question? Yeah, point of order, though, if, if each person has the ability to speak for 10 minutes, if Jesse ceded five of his minutes, wouldn't he still have five remaining? If well, someone were to see that there are five Jesse. Together. Jesse didn't cede his five minutes from what I heard. Jesse spoke through his lawyer for 10 minutes. Five minutes of him, five minutes of Emma. So he had a representative, his attorney, speak on right. his behalf. Right, but if someone were so so when you when you cede your five minutes to somebody else, 
Yes. You then relinquish your ability to speak at all. No one could then relinquish their that's, five minutes to you. That's Is correct. That, I mean, because okay. you've spoken. I think that, has spoken. I think, yeah. yeah, I think right. if you were to, if you were to clarify it that way, I think that might make it clearer. Right, thank you, Vice Chair Pepe. Uh, I guess let's uh, move on. Uh, again, uh, Kim, uh, you're welcome to give testimony, but I understood that uh, Kim said that uh, she had given a uh, written testimony and had nothing further to add. So let's move ahead, uh, Iris. We can call the next uh, person. Kylie Schultz. Just waiting for Kylie to join. Good evening, Kylie. If you'd like to state your name and address uh, for the record in any organization you wish to represent, you may go ahead and give testimony. Uh, Kylie, uh, sorry, we can't hear you. Uh, Kylie is still waiting to hear uh, any audio from you. Uh, Kylie, we'll give you an opportunity to uh, try one more time here, uh, and then we'll move on, and then maybe we'll retry uh, later uh, before we adjourn from tonight. All right, in the interest of time, Iris, let's move ahead, and we'll come back and check Kylie again. Okay. Jan Steinbach. Uh, one point of order again, uh, I know we're not supposed to consider the comments testimony, but it looks like uh, Kylie's giving uh, indication uh, in the uh, chat uh, that um, Kylie would like to cede the time uh, to uh, Helen. Uh, I'm not sure who that is. Um, do we have a Helen, uh, Iris, who would like to testify? Helen, um Bradley already testified and had a, had time ceded to her already All right. earlier in the evening. All right, um, then let's go ahead with uh, Ms. Steinbach uh, and then um, uh, if staff um, thinks that uh, we should, uh, if there's time that is should be allocated to Helen, uh, we'll check uh, after Ms. Steinbach's uh, testimony. So. Ms. Steinbeck, if you'd like to give uh, your name and address and any organizations you represent, you may go ahead and give your testimony. Thank you. My name is Jan Steinbach. I live at 16513 Bonaire Avenue. I'm just around the corner from the end of Sunset Avenue. And I'm speaking in opposition. Uh, like several other people, I am... Uh, pleased to hear that the city is looking for places to locate low-income housing. Um, and I would be fine with some low-income housing on this property somewhere, but I also feel like the, um, there are adjacent properties that are already zoned for residential that should be looked at for that instead. Um, Rosemary Road, yeah, the slide presentation that the city showed earlier, they mentioned that it Boone's Ferry is an arterial, but in the city's own transportation impact analysis, it's not just an arterial, it's a major arterial, which means it carries more than 20,000 vehicles per day. Um, and even with all of the design elements from the Westlake Grove design plan included in any proposed development there, I personally would not want to have my living room window or a patio opening right onto Boone's Ferry, onto a road that carries over 20,000 vehicles a day. To me, that just doesn't seem very livable. I feel like a lot of effort and time, months, a lot of people's input went into the West Lake Grove design plan. And they very deliberately chose to put commercial properties facing Boone's Ferry and in those areas. 
And so I feel that A, rezoning it, and B, especially allowing a um, one site exception to the um, OC zoning at this location is terribly inappropriate. Um, I feel that the buffer zone that the commercial properties create uh, do a lot to enhance the livability of our neighborhood and to also support the commercial businesses along Boone's Ferry. I feel that the city mentioned that there was a transit stop that uh, putting housing along Boone's Ferry was appropriate because there's transit access, with, access within a quarter mile. But I went on to TriMet's site and there are two bus routes that go one that goes down Boone's Ferry that has four buses a day. If I was relying on a bus to get me back and forth to a shopping center, a store, to my employer, to, to my job, I wouldn't be able to do it. I couldn't even get do a grocery shopping trip by bus if I needed to, if it was difficult for me to walk. Um, my husband is handicapped, so that is something that we are particularly sensitive to. A quarter mile can be an incredibly long distance if you have any accessibility issues. The other bus that comes within uh, striking distance of the intersection, again, both of these bus routes only run on weekdays. One offers four buses a day, one offers six buses a day. That's it. Nothing in the evenings, nothing in the middle of the day. They're like early morning and mid to late afternoon only. Um, There are zones, there are properties along um, Boone's Ferry that have not yet been developed that do allow for Rick's, I'm sorry, residential with mixed use, where we would again see a property probably like the one on the other corner of Sunset that has commercial buildings in the front with residential townhomes in the back. And uh, those create a nice buffer zone. They create a great uh, mix of uses so that there's daytime use and evening use and those are and something like that here would be appropriate too. Um, I feel that a single site specific exception is not okay because again it's going to as mentioned by somebody else it's going to set you guys up for other exceptions down the road. And I want to also point out that the reason a lot of the neighbors are concerned about traffic is that sunset comes up to Bonaire which then you can make a short little one block run to Washington Court, then the Lake Forest Boulevard and out to Carmen Drive and onto I-5. A lot of the neighbors in adjacent areas and adjacent neighborhoods know this back shortcut to Carmen Drive and I-5. And there's already increased traffic on Bonaire and Sunset because of that. Adding residential units there um, in any major quantity Literally, if we if your proposed uh, high density development were to be realized, it would triple the traffic on Sunset and Bonaire and Washington. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Steinbach. Uh, commissioners, any questions for Ms. Steinbach? None. Thank you. Uh, Iris, uh, can we please call the next person in opposition? Certainly. Randy Sebastian. Good evening, Mr. Sebastian. If you'd like to state your name and address for the record in any organization you wish to represent, you may go ahead and give your testimony. Oh, you're on mute, Mr. Sebastian. If you'd like to unmute, you can go ahead and state your name and address for the record in any organization you wish to represent. I'm well, still on mute, sorry. We'll give you a second to unmute. Yeah, now you're unmuted, go ahead. Okay, hello, I'm uh, Randy Sebastian, uh, Renaissance Ventures. Uh, we uh, own the property. Uh, my partner, Kimberly Love, and I own the uh, 
the office buildings next door. Again, years if and years I can, ago. I'm sorry to interrupt before you, Mr. Ben Sebastian. Yeah. You, uh, an attorney spoke on behalf of Renaissance Ventures. Are you speaking on your own behalf? Um, I can speak on my own behalf, yes. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, years ago, I built the uh, buildings um, in 2004, and we went through about a three-year process going through the West Grove Design District to build the buildings. And uh, lots and lots of planning, lots and lots of uh, work with the city. And in fact, we won the Lake Oswego Beautification Award, um, the Headley Beautification Award with our buildings that year and very proud of what we did. And, and I'll tell you, if uh, we were next to high density residential, we, we wouldn't have built the buildings. Um, and uh, so we're, we're concerned about that. We obviously build homes for, uh, and we build affordable housing. We've done affordable housing. We've done affordable housing in, in Portland for uh, Catholic charities. So we're not opposed to it. I'm not opposed to it. But again, it's been stated, the location is bad. I'm sure the city can find better places for uh, this. It's close to parks, close to schools, close to, uh, and, and uh, you know, it, it's, um, there's not good public transportation there as we've heard. Um, so it's, it's really, it's convenient the city has the property. And the thing that's kind of funny is we assembled the site for Washington Federal because we were going to build an office complex for Washington Federal. So we assembled the property, tore down the old homes, got it ready, and then Washington Federal uh, halted uh, going forward and they were approached by the city and uh, they, they sold the site. Um, and I'll just tell you, if the city ends up um, not getting its own, uh, my partner and I would be interested in build, buying the property from the city and building uh, building something that is zoned correctly. And we would not ask for variances. We would not ask for, um, uh, we would not ask for variances and we would not ask for um, uh, zone changes. We would build what the Lake Grove Design District uh, is, stands for and what's been there for 20 years. So uh, we can solve this problem. Thank you. Sorry, uh, thank you, Mr. Sebastian. Commissioner Fisher, you have a question? Yeah, Randy, you said that that uh, if this had existed, you wouldn't have built in this area. Why? Um, I had a site uh, building in West Lynn uh, that was next to residential apartments. My site was vandalized virtually every weekend. We had skateboarders destroying things. We had kids vandalizing. We had lots of problems at night when we weren't there. I've sold that building and we went to, we've been at our site for 14 years, 16 years. We went 2004, so 15 years we've been there. We've had zero vandalism, zero um, theft, zero anything. We've been left alone. And now you're gonna have a lot of people right next door and I've seen it happen before. and. So I wouldn't do it. And we bought into this. And I remember years ago, I was talking to a planner at the city of Lake Oswego. And he's like, this is going to be a beautiful site. It's going to be wonderful. You build your building here and everybody is going to um, love it. And because it's the zone, it's hard to get through. But once you do, and once the zone is done, there was so much vision put into this. Um, and I, you know, Hamid Pishvai, the, the building next door is zone is called the HP Grove building. Hamid Pishvai, HP Grove. So Hamid worked with us very, very closely on this. And so, so much work went into the Grove Design District and now it's just being wadded up and thrown it over because it's convenient to build affordable housing. Well, there's, why not, why not foothills where, where there's fields, where there's parks, where there's stuff. I mean, you're a kid growing up on that corner. It's not, I drive it every day. It's it's really bad planning to put it there. And I love the city of Lake Oswego and I love, I'm very proud to have our built business there and I've lived in the city years. You know, my grandparents farmed in first edition. They're, they're buried in the Oswego Pioneer uh, gra graveyard. I mean, the whole thing. And so my point is I'm proud of our city, proud of what we do. I totally support, we need to do more for affordable housing, but this location 
is just too convenient. It's like, oh, well, and it was somebody's idea, and I, I know who it was, and I won't mention it now because I can't verify it, but it was somebody's idea of just a feel-good thing, like, oh, we need affordable housing. Sure, let's just stick, stick it there in the worst corner we can think. There's so many better places to do it, and if you need to rezone something, do it where it's appropriate. And so that's that's my, and again, I'm willing to buy this property from the city and put office buildings there, the correct, the correct zoning. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, any other questions? Commissioner Fisher, did you have any other questions? None? No? I do, but- Oh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I don't wanna cut anyone off. Go ahead, Commissioner Fisher. Well, I'm, I'm just curious. You said that uh, a high rise building would cause crime. Is that what you're, that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, but because I know that where you are, there are, there are residential things in back of you and you're saying that they didn't cause crime. Well, I don't, there's not the, okay, those people, the residential places, they have yards, their kids, their family, they have places to play. There's no place to play here. It's a, it's a, it's a parking lot for a, a high, for a tall, um, small apartments. Where are the kids going to play? There's no, there's no place to play. You know, um, there's an affordable housing development going in in New York. They have a clubhouse. A, a friend of mine's brother is, is, is an a neighbor over there. There's a pool, there's a clubhouse, there's a park, there's a underground parking, all sorts of things. And we could do better for people. This is just really not, not appropriate. There's better places for kids to live and grow up. Would you want your grandkid living on that corner? No place to, no place to play? I wouldn't. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sebastian. Uh, no other questions. Uh, we'll move on to the next person. Iris, would you like to call the next person? Okay. Vaughn Engweiler. Uh, Good evening, uh, Fawn. If you'd like to give your name and address for the record in any organization that you represent, you may go ahead and give testimony. Hey, good evening. My name is Fawn Ingweiler. I live at 5343 Madrona Street. I'm on the corner of Bonaire and Madrona, just the next block up from Sunset. Um, I have been fortunate to live on Madrona um, probably 44 years out of my 40, uh, probably 43 years out of my 46 years. Um, I can say that, um, you know, just in general, every little incidental change does have a, an effect on a neighborhood. And um, I think um, from the lens that I come from, is perspective of seeing so much change, you know, from growing up here, my father lives on the same street and change is inevitable, but to not take into account that everything does have a greater impact on the community is sort of like a very naive way uh, to sort of view things. Um, I have to say from the perspective of the height variance, um, I think that that in itself, I agree with the other um, people in opposition. Um, I think that is definitely something that um, I disagree with. Um, another component that I'm really concerned about is from the standpoint of the livelihood and the well-being of people that we would invite into our community, you know, um, to bring it down to a project, just to do it, to say that we're doing something or somebody has, you know, instituted this idea that, you know, um, we need this low-income housing. Well, hell, we need a low-income housing, housing forever. I mean, with the amount of people that everyone has said that are being priced out of the community, this is something that's not a new thing. And to see when we've had the big projects on Cruise Way, come in with you know, whatever that is, 400 apartment units or whatever that is, and have nothing sort of already built in to sort of have low-income housing be included in those giant projects. It's baffling to me that this has got to be the big push to sign off, you know, that this is the spot. Because honestly, if somebody is on a budget, the closest, and don't get me wrong, it's a lovely store, but the closest grocery store for somebody to shop at is the zoo pants. If you're on a fixed income, you are not going to be able to shop at Zoo Pants for your, you know, 
Albertsons is down the way, but we're talking practical, you know, practicality of a situation for people, you know, people that are on a fixed income, most likely a car is an extravagant expense. So we don't have, like Jan stated, a transportation system set up for that. We never have. Um, it's to a secondary station to Bridgeport, or you have to go to downtown Lake Oswego. You know, we don't have the amenities to support these people. All the amenities that we do are downtown Lake Oswego, like a library, um, walkability to the transit center. Um, and not to mention just like the fact that we can't even get basic goods in our town. The people don't have prime <laughs> to get, you know, towels. It's not, it's a situation. I see elderly folks, you know, that live in the low income housing by Lake Grove and they're walking to the store, you know, with their baskets of items and not everybody is going to have accessibility to a car or actually maybe they're elderly or a situation. Um, it's just a real safety concern and we're not really thinking about the real reality of bringing people here, not supporting them fully. If we're gonna be here, they're gonna need to have amenities and um, services available for people. And it's definitely a situation where that street is way too busy. You know, it's from two lanes to four lanes. It's, it's, and now with the additional stops, people are blowing through the stops. I mean, no one's ever known where Madrona Street is until the last three months when they put the sign up, you know, and it's like, people are still blowing through those red, the red lights. I mean, this is a serious situation um, to put children on. Um, and not to mention the impact on schools that we already have in Lake Oswego. Um, I just think there's, it needs to be a situation and I'm all for low income housing. I just think that the project has not been well thought out. Um, and as far as density goes, we have those were six homes at one point and an office building is such a better option for this area to have the traffic through the daytime and the evening, you know, it's free. I just think that that's such a dense corner um, for how many people that's more people than are on Madrona street, more families are on Madrona street. So I really appreciate all the effort people are putting into this and thank you. Um, and thank you for letting me um, voice my opinion. Well, thank you, Ms. Engwiler. Uh, commissioners, any questions? None. All right. Iris, could we please call the next person in opposition? Certainly, the next person will be Priscilla Kelly. Uh, Hi there. Evening. My name is. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for Ms. your. Yeah, please state your name and address for the record in any organization you wish to represent and then go ahead and give your testimony. Thank you. Okay. My name is Priscilla Kelly and I live at 16546 Bonaire Avenue on the right on the corner of Bonaire and West Sunset. I'm not representing any entities this evening. Um, I do feel that there is a need for affordable housing and creating a more inclusive culture in our community, as was mentioned um, earlier this evening. I was surprised to hear tonight that there are other potential locations that would not need to be rezoned. Um, I did submit a letter yesterday, but I want to focus this time on how deeply concerned I am about the impact that the increase in density or an increase in density will have on the safety of the many, many young children, my daughter included, who um, already struggle to walk and play on our narrow run down and unsafe streets. The amount of traffic that has increased while the Boonesbury project has been underway has been really alarming and surprising. And the thought of potentially even more traffic created by 50 to 54 additional households, as well as the potential increase in parked cars on the streets due to a potential lack of on-site parking, which would make it even more difficult to see small children really scares me. I think, um, I can't remember when exactly, but within the time that I've lived here, which is nine years, um, there have been children who have been hit on streets in, in our neighborhood. And the thought of an increase in traffic and the potential for something like that to happen again um, is really terrifying for the parents who live in our neighborhood. Um, I'm also concerned about the children who would potentially be living in this high density housing. There aren't very many parks, as it was mentioned earlier, that are nearby, and the ones that are anywhere close 
are already dangerous to walk to. Um, as it was also mentioned earlier, the two elementary schools that are nearby, River Grove and Lake Grove, I've been told are already at capacity. So I wonder where um, these children would go to school. And I would like to echo what Ms. McFadden said earlier that I'm concerned about concerned about shuffling or stuffing um, 50 to 54 families onto a corner on a busy street and how that would impact them. If we could find a way to ensure safety for all by controlling traffic and potential parking issues, I do like the idea of prioritizing frontline workers who serve in our community, but I do hope that the high density housing we're offering them is safe and livable, um, a livable environment for the children and the families. Thank you so much for your consideration of my testimony. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Uh, commissioners, any questions? None? All right, thank you. Uh, Iris, could we please call the next person? Certainly, um, Tessa Heath. Well, good evening, uh, Ms. Heath, if you'd like to uh, give uh, your name, address, and any organization you wish to represent. Uh, you may go ahead and give your testimony. Hello, uh, my name is Tessa Heath. I live on 5284 West Sunset Drive, and I am not representing any organization. Um, I will say that I am so happy that I am following Priscilla as I want to echo everything she said. I feel like I'm not hearing enough people speak about the children who already live here. Um, I have three young daughters, um, two that will be attending school in the fall at Lake Grove, which from my understanding is already at capacity, who will suffer from larger class sizes. Um, and the closest parks that we can walk to are the Waluga parks. And as mentioned, are already so hard to walk to um, because of the narrow streets and increased traffic that Priscilla mentioned we are already having. And this is not West Lake. We do not have sidewalks built in in our neighborhoods. Um, West Sunset road quality specifically is horrible. Um, we have at least a dozen of huge potholes that um, you, you can't, you almost can't even avoid them driving on the street. Uh, and then to compare a high density building to a business that is only open, most businesses are only open Monday through Friday, um, nine to five ish there's gonna be a lot more night traffic on our small, already unsafe streets. Um, and I, I heard someone saying in the uh, pro who wanted this, to, the rezoning to happen, that this will bring diversity to Lake Oswego. I just, I, I don't understand how that is even like a thought. If you're saying we want to encourage diversity in Lake Oswego and offer low income or affordable housing, but you know what? We're actually going to stick them all in this one spot. And there's no, there no, there's no, you can say that there's public transportation, but there's not. <laughs> there is one bus that passes by. And as, as already said, it, it is only a Monday through Friday. It doesn't even run hourly. That, that is not public transportation. Um, there was no mention whether these units would have washer and dryers in the units. There's no laundromats in Lake Oswego. The closest laundromat is in Tualatin. And how are these low income individuals where there's not even enough park, like parking spots for two adults to have a car going to be able to use this transportation to get to the laundromat um, or anything else for all that matters. And uh, this is, um, I heard, and it's really stuck with me, a circle peg that is trying to be fit into a square hole. And this needs to be rethinked. Um, 
I do not believe that this high density building in this spot makes sense. I don't think it makes sense anywhere. I think there needs to be a calculated, um, really thought, thought through planning for affordable housing throughout Lake Oswego. I do not think it's okay to just do one huge high density building and, and you know, just mark it off the to-do list. That, that's not showing respect for us. It's not showing respect for anybody who would move into them. Um, thank you for letting me voice my concerns and arguments. Uh, thank you, Ms. Heath. Uh, commissioners, any questions for Ms. Heath? None, all right. Iris, could we please call the next person? Stephen Kessler. Good evening, Ms. Kessler, Mr. Kessler. If you'd like to state your name and address for the record in any organization you wish to represent, you may go ahead and give your testimony. Uh, Mr. Kessler, if you'd like to unmute, you can go ahead and start. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Stephen Kessler. I live at 5283 West Sunset Drive in Lake Oswego. And I do not represent uh, any organization except myself. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me uh, this opportunity to speak. I've lived here for 40 some years. And uh, I listened to the, uh, the uh, comments from the uh, people who supported the uh, proposition, the initial proposition. And I must say, I do agree with some of them. However, I noted that none of them live on West Sunset Drive. Therefore, they have no idea of what the traffic impact would have on us if a, uh, a building project of this uh, magnitude would be allowed to occur. I must ask, has there been a full traffic analysis done on West Sunset Drive, Bonaire, or the other adjoining streets other than the uh, memo from Kittleson and Son? Because I did not see a report in the uh, staff re in the staff report. Um, the number of housing units that are proposed, 54 as I understand, with uh, 68 uh, proposed parking spaces on the surface of it sounds very, you know, very generous. Except when you realize that most households have more than one car, most households have at least two vehicles. So the number of uh, parking spaces is absolutely insufficient. Therefore, the, you're gonna have overflow parking and that's gonna wind up on West Sunset Drive, which already, uh, it, 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 it's a narrow street. It's, it's basically one, one one car wide. Uh, children play on the street, people walk on the street, traffic is increasing on the street. Um, they're, they're, this is a safety issue. Um, you know, there are other issues here. Uh, the property values of the uh, surrounding homes are going to be affected by high density zoning in a adjacent to a, uh, a single family uh, zone neighborhood. Um, has any other areas been looked at for appropriate rezoning other than uh, West Sunset Drive? I don't know that the that the, there's been a full uh, study done on this issue. And I would like to request that the 
record be held open for another seven days for a receipt of new testimony. Um, and I also request that the commission postpone the remainder of the hearing so the application can be completed. Um, the full transportation study needs to be done and a full alternative site analysis needs to be done, neither of which I believe have been completed or at least if they have, they have not been submitted in the public record for review. Um, that's all I have One to minute. say. Thank you, Mr. Kessler. Uh, any questions? Commissioners for Mr. Kessler, none. Uh, again, I would like to just make uh, another reminder. Uh, we're trying to get as many people uh, heard tonight as uh, possible. So uh, for the upcoming speakers, if you'd like to uh, just, you know, um, agree with points that you may have already heard uh, and then state uh, your support for the testimony. And then um, uh, if there's anything added, uh, anything new that you'd like to add, uh, that may make us uh, a little bit more efficient. Uh, so Iris, can we please call the next person? Certainly Gary Bradley. Good evening, Mr. Bradley. I'd like to state your name and address for the record and any organization you wish to represent. You may go ahead and give your testimony. Uh, yes, thank you. This is Gary Bradley. I live at 5211 West Sunset Drive, and I don't represent any organization. Um, thank, first of all, thank you for the time to be heard. Appreciate it. Um, I'd like to go on record as opposing the rezoning and amendments for the parcels at the corner of West Sunset Drive and Boone's Ferry Road. Um, I purchased my home on West Sunset Drive in 1996. The home is a single family residence zoned R75 and is surrounded by other single family residences with similar zoning. And it is just 150 feet from the parcels in question. Uh, I implore each member of the planning commission to come to West Sunset Drive, park your vehicle, take a quick walk up and down West Sunset Drive and notice all the single family homes and how close they are to the proposed development site that you're trying to rezone. Uh, if you should decide to skip the walk up West Sunset and simply drive down it, you'll have to be careful because you'll have to pull over in the gravel and wait until another car passes if there's someone coming the other way. It's just as likely the other car will pull over and let you pass. Um, if that happens, please give a friendly wave when they let you go by as it's probably one of the residents whose lives you're about to impact with your proposed changes. It might be a member of the Anderson family that owns the house directly across the street from the lots in question. Or it might be the Olson family whose front door is only 63 feet from the development site. It might be the Croft family, the Newtons, the Immamuras, the McFaddens, the Kesslers, the Heath, the Rand Randalls family, or my own Bradley family. And you'll want to watch out for children watch riding bicycles or people walking their dogs, for it's not only a narrow road, but one with no sidewalks. These are all real people who live on West Sunset Drive. We live in and love Lake Oswego, and we enjoy the lifestyle that it affords. To say that these lives will not be affected is completely disingenuous. In fact, it would be a complete lie. This is a completely inappropriate space to have high density housing. Of course, you would never know any of this from the application because it doesn't address many important issues in, the comprehens in a comprehensive way. You won't see any of these people on your planning and zoning maps. You won't see their families, their aging parents, or their little children, but I guarantee they exist and that their lives will be impacted by the decisions you make tonight. I ask you to reject this application outright, but if you won't do this, then please at least grant a continuance to look beyond the zoning maps and come to West Sunset Drive, get out of your car, and take a good hard look at the homes and the people affected before simply approving approving this woefully incomplete application that never would have seen the light of day if it was submitted by a private party and not the city itself. Do an actual traffic study instead of relying on a traffic memo with no supporting documentation for the public. Do the proper due diligence to look at all possible alternate sites within Lake Oswego that could be rezoned and may be more suitable for the proposed zoning. In other words, do the jobs of city planners the way they should be done. Um, city planners should know better. The most basic city planning 101 course would teach you the difference between arterial and local streets and the need for traffic studies. 
It will teach about taking a look at property inventory and maintaining neighborhood character. Not to mention that an Ethics 101 course would teach about things like conflict of interest, such as when the party submitting an application is also the party with the power to approve or disapprove such an application. Ethics course would also teach about misrepresentation, like insisting that this is not a single family residence neighborhood while ignoring the facts on the ground. You know, probably better than most of us here in the neighborhood do, that the Land Use Board of Appeals would never uphold the approval of an application like the one this city has submitted to itself. And don't tell me again that this is not a single family residential neighborhood. The only reason the lots in question are not zoned for single family residential is because you have changed the zoning in recent years. When I moved into this neighborhood in 1996, there were no office or commercial buildings on any of those lots. Um, and over the years I've lived here, I've watched the single family residences on that corner be torn down one by one. One minute, one minute. I have to admit that I was pretty impressed with our city planners and all of the thought and, commu and community involvement that went into developing the Lake Grove Design District. This was planning that took the citizens' input seriously, and it tried hard to minimize the impacts on surrounding neighborhoods. This was city planning that took its time to do things right. This was city planning at its best. It saddens me to say that by contrast, I've never been more disappointed in our city planners than I am today, as they attempt to cut corners and disregard facts in order to push through an agenda that is not in the best interest of the surrounding neighborhood. This city, this is city planning at its worst. I ask the city planners to step up and reconsider what they're asking for and to not approve this improper application. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Mr. Bradley. Um, one point I think I should call out, Mr. Bradley, is that you know you made reference to ethics and you made reference to uh, the uh, planning department, uh, both submitting the application and then also approving it. Um, just a point of clarification, you know, it's our it's the planning commission itself, not staff, that makes a recommendation to council on whether council wants to approve. And it's our elected leaders that we put in place. These are these are leaders that um, you know we voted for. So. It's, it's really a democratic system that we're following. And I would say I disagree with the comment on, you know, conflict of interest and some type of ethics uh, violation. So, so I hope, you know, it, maybe it was just a misunderstanding, but it's definitely not uh, staff and the planning staff that's uh, presenting this. It uh, was asked for counsel and, uh, you know, we're hearing all of the testimony as commissioners, members of the community, will make a recommendation to counsel and uh, the uh, council uh, you know, uh, decides as the final decision in these uh, matters. Uh, but just wanted to clarify that it's 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 not staff that's you know uh, proposing that uh, um, you know we take this action or that they're deciding it. It's a group of other bodies. Uh, any other commissioners want to comment? All right. Well, thank you for your testimony, okay. Mr. Bradley. You know, yes, thank, thank you. you for that clarification. No problem. Uh, Iris, would you like to call the next person? Ron Kelly. Uh, Mr. Kelly, if you'd like to state your name and address and any organization you wish to represent, you may go ahead and give your testimony. Yes, oh, my thanks. name is John Kelly and I live at 16546 Bon Air. Oh, okay, I, I, haven't did, I don't know why some people's pictures. Oh, point of order. Sorry, Mr. Kelly. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bradley, if you could mute or Iris, if we could oh. take Mr. Sorry. Bradley out. Oh, no problem. Uh, sorry for the interruption there. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Kelly. Uh, did we lose? Uh, did we lose Mr. Kelly? Iris, can we bring him back in? Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Kelly, sorry for that interruption. You may oh. go ahead. If you state your name and address for the record and then any organization you wish to represent, you may proceed. Sorry for the interruption again. Oh, no worries. My name is Sean Kelly and I live at 16546 Bonaire Avenue uh, and I'm representing myself, no other sure. entities. Um, and yes, thank you for taking the time tonight to consider our concerns. Um, I wanted to begin by stating that I'm really excited that the city is working on exploring where and how to build low income housing. Uh, I didn't realize how long overdue it was. So that's, that's very exciting to, uh, that you guys are doing that. Um, however, in this case, I am in full agreement with and in support of my neighbor's testimonies that have been given so far in opposition to the proposed zoning change. 
Um, I would like to ask for continuance so the city may do its due diligence and better complete its application as well as complete an absolutely necessary full blown traffic study um, of not only Sunset, but you know, Bonaire, Madrona, like all the, the streets surrounding um, and complete an alternative site analysis as well. Um, like everyone's been saying, I'm, a lot of people touched on my the points that I want to talk about. So I'm just gonna paraphrase some things, but my wife and I moved here almost 10 years ago and we chose this neighborhood because of how family friendly it was and how wonderful the schools were. And uh, the one thing we've loved living here that's thus far is that so many young families have moved in and there's just so many kids that fill the streets uh, every weekend and in the afternoons and especially during COVID, you know, everyone's been outside and, and uh, just trying to make the best of things. And we've definitely seen a huge uptick in the amount of traffic that comes down our street. Like my wife Priscilla said, there have actually been uh, young children who have been hit and or almost hit on our streets back here. So it, it, it's been a really dangerous moment. Um, we were outside by one of our little libraries and uh, uh, with a bunch of kids and the cars were just zooming down our street on Bonaire. And uh, it's often used as, as others have stated as a cut through, as a shortcut uh, to get from Boone's to Cruiseway or from the highway to Carmen, like different areas. So I believe that building uh, a residential uh, place of that capacity would drastically increase the amount of traffic that's coming down our streets and would not be safe for our kids as well as the kids who are going to be moving in. Um, and then everyone else touched on these points, but I just wanna reiterate that our schools are at or above capacity right now. Um, our daughter's in Spanish immersion and they're actually being moved out of River Grove to another school um, to make more room. So just wanna bring up that like the kids that are gonna be moving into this place, um, not only is it a dangerous corner to be on, but it's already kind of a dangerous neighborhood to play in on the streets. And so I just think it's a bad idea. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, commissioners, any questions for Mr. Kelly? None? All right, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Kelly. Uh, so we're actually at, uh, I have the 9.53, uh, as I had uh, outlined uh, in the start of the meeting, uh, we wish to uh, stop uh, at about uh, five minutes uh, till 10. Uh, and then uh, the proposal is that, uh, you know, for those who are signed up to speak uh, today and didn't have an opportunity, uh, we would like to uh, move that uh, to, I believe the, uh, uh, July 12th uh, meeting. Uh, I'll check with staff to make sure that uh, date is correct. Uh, but those who had um, uh, signed up to speak tonight and were able, uh, were unable to do so uh, due to the time limit we have here uh, tonight, uh, we'll give them an opportunity to uh, testify on uh, July uh, 12th. And then in addition, uh, I'd like to just clarify maybe uh, the written uh, testimony. Uh, so we'll continue to accept written testimony until the hearing uh, is closed uh, to all uh, testimony. I think those are the major points. Uh, commissioners, uh, any comments or questions on the process or even if staff, if, if there's anything that I said that was uh, needs correction, I appreciate uh, any uh, comments. Thank you, Chair. We appreciate the opportunity to continue receiving testimony and uh, and July 12th would be fine. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, uh, with that said, I would like to uh, suspend uh, the uh, testimony tonight. Uh, and then uh, again, uh, we'll continue till uh, July uh, 12th. Um, Is hmm. there any boon? Yes. Would well, like yeah, before we, before we go, I just want to, We've sure. had four requests under this under the code and statute for a continuance. And I just want to understand what the commission's continuance is to uh, in a format point of view. You, the, um, you can either continue the hearing for persons to present and rebut new testimony and evidence, and they would be able to orally or, or submit written, written evidence in that format to the next meeting, or uh, you can leave the record open for additional written evidence or testimony. That has to be at least seven days, and then there's a rebuttal period. Now, do I understand the commission then to leave it open for written 
testimony for those who have already testified, and then we're going to take oral testimony uh, for those people who are yet remaining on the on the sign up sheet. Is that the plan? That's uh, that was a proposal I was trying to outline, uh, Attorney Boone. Okay. Commissioner, any uh, comments uh, on yeah, the proposal? Yeah, for the continuing right. specifications. Yeah. With that proposal, Chair Heap. Thank you, Vice Chair Pape. Yeah, that's the way I understood it also. Okay. Yep. Just okay. Thank you so much. Yep. All right. So at this point, again, I'd like to stop the uh, public uh, hearing tonight, uh, and we'll continue it. Uh, to July 12th, uh, given the outline that we just uh, uh, described uh, regarding uh, oral and written testimony. Uh, so thank you, everybody uh, that came out. I really appreciate everybody in the community, uh, you know, their willingness to participate and give all the feedback. We really appreciate it. So thank you. And we'll, we'll continue on uh, to July 12th. Uh, Director Siegel, I'd like to move on to our uh, next agenda item, which is really schedule review. Uh, would you like to give us a schedule update? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Your next regularly scheduled meeting is July 28th. Uh, you have a work session scheduled that had been rescheduled from this evening um, to continue your uh, discussion of House Bill 2001 as the city begins uh, or prepares for uh, the appointment of an advisory committee uh, that will be assisting the commission and the council in that effort. So that's on July 28th. And then June 28th. Yeah, June 28th. Thank you. June 28th. Correct. June 28th. And then the next meeting, July 12th, is uh, the continue, continued hearing that you um, had just discussed this evening. That, that's all that we have for schedule update. All right. Uh, thank you, Director Siegel. Uh, so that's all we had uh, for tonight. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, to uh, staff and to the commissioners for uh, joining. Uh, good night. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mike. Recording stopped.